candidate. Senator, one of the two Democratic senators from the state of Connecticut. Senator, it's good to see you. Uh, this Aaron, is a course of action that you long believed was necessary, that Saddam Hussein had to go, and that uh, military force, if necessary, should be used. What are your thoughts tonight? Well, uh, my thoughts obviously are with the American military who are there, hoping and praying for their success uh, right now, uh, hoping that this attempt at decapitation was successful, because after all is said and done, this is all about one evil dictator who possesses uh, brutal weapons with which uh, he will threaten uh, and, and hurt a lot of people, including a lot of Americans, unless we take them away from him. Uh, I understand the odds against that decapitation working, but uh, it, it might, and if it does, uh, all of us, including the Iraqi people, are going to be uh, very fortunate. The, the, the theory here, obviously, is if you take out Saddam Hussein or if you take out the leadership, then uh, the military folds, the resistance disappears, and the Americans and the Brits walk in, essentially, into Iraq, into Baghdad, go about their business. Um, is that one not necessarily expected to play out that way? Well, that would be the optimal situation, and uh, it, it's not uh, a fantasy, it seems to me, because it's clear uh, one, that Saddam has ruled by fear uh, and, and has, has killed any number of people under him, himself, uh, who, have, who have shown some disloyalty. So if it becomes clear that uh, he is gone, uh, then you have to ask, what's the motivation for all those in the Iraqi military to continue to want to fight us? We're, we're offering them uh, a better way and, uh, and a better life. and. Uh, I, obviously, our military will act cautiously. I'm, I'm very interested in the reports that we just heard that Reuters was saying that what, it, what appears to be uh, American military has taken over some of the state radio in Baghdad. And I do want to say that our military is going at this with an extraordinary combination, uh, combination of information technology, telecommunication skill, intelligence, and uh, uh, high-tech weapons and, of course, the most skilled fighting men and women uh, in the history of the world. So we've got a lot going for us. Senator Lieberman, um, do you ever think this might have been you who had to be in the White House with a president that uh, these are decisions you, have had, you might have had to make? Do you ever think about such things? I, I do occasionally think about such things, but uh, uh, tonight is one of those nights, I think, in which we're all standing shoulder to shoulder. Uh, uh, President Bush is a Republican. I'm a Democrat. We ran against him last time. I'm running. Uh, I'm seeking the office he holds now. But tonight, there's not uh, uh, an inch of distance between us. We're standing uh, together uh, behind uh, the American men and women in uniform, confident uh, that they're going to achieve the victory that uh, our security demands and the world security demands. And I do want to add this word. Uh, what we are doing here is not only in the interest of the safety of the American people, because believe me, uh, Saddam Hussein w would have used these weapons against us eventually or given them to terrorists uh, who would have. But this is what we are doing here in overthrowing Saddam and removing those weapons of mass destruction, taking them into our control is good for the security of every nation in the world and uh, it, it, it is it is a task we are taking on it is not a selfish task it is a task of high uh, justice and necessity and i'd say idealism and the best uh, tradition of american uh, principles and patriotism and i'm, I'm proud and and just grateful that we have the kind of fighting force that we have over there. We're, we're going to win this. Uh, Senator, I don't think anybody, uh, uh, I suspect on the planet, doubts that the American forces will overwhelm ultimately the Iraqis and win this. It is a complicated process that comes after of putting Iraq together. It's always good to talk to you, sir. Senator Joe Lieberman uh, with Thank us you, this Aaron. evening from Washington. Um, as we approach 11 o'clock here in the east, uh, the president now, 45 minutes ago, made clear that the opening stages of the disarmament of Iraq, the war with Iraq, 
is underway. Uh, we know of at least two sites. We have been told by our Pentagon correspondent of at least two sites around Baghdad that have been hit in what were called targets of opportunity. And further, we know that at least one of those sites was an attempt to get at the Iraqi leadership, whether that specifically included Saddam Hussein or not. We don't know, and we obviously do not know whether it was successful or not. Christian. And one of the things that President Bush said in his speech tonight was to take note of what he said, 35 countries, uh, I think that's what he said, 35, were supporting the United States, whether politically or militarily or with moral support. But of course, that has been one of the controversies over this war, because there has not been anything like the kind of coalition that was assembled back in 1991. And to go to some immediate reaction that's now coming out of some quarters in the Islamic world, we're seeing on wire reports from Indonesia, from Malaysia, and from Thailand that moderate and conservative Islamic groups are saying that they condemn this attack and that it would lead to more attacks against the United States. And of course, that is one of the issues that many of the leaders who have been against uh, this war here have warned about, that this could increase the incidence of terrorism. So we'll wait and obviously closely monitor what comes out of that. We have not yet heard any reaction from the Arab world. We know that the Arab leaders, the Persian Gulf state leaders, and other Arabs in this region had basically resigned themselves to war. And of course, Kuwait and other Persian Gulf states are launching pads for this military action. But let's go to Nick Robertson in Baghdad right now. And I just want to know, Nick, uh, whether your Arabic-speaking colleagues there have been able to confirm uh, some some of what may have been uh, going on on the uh, Iraqi radio there, and whether these announcers have in fact uh, changed, and whether there's some American military announcers going on there. Christian, we have indeed been monitoring those radio stations, and I would like to bring in CNN's Reem Brahimi, who is here with me right now. She has been listening in to those radio broadcasts since uh, the anti-aircraft gunfire started this morning. Let me bring in Reem. Good morning. A uh, few uh, messages have been broadcast on uh, Baghdad radio. Uh, first of one, the first one by the president's son, Uday Saddam Hussein, essentially uh, making uh, making a call to all the Iraqis, calling them to protect their leader, saying, "God give us patience. God protect our country from the foreign aggression, and God protect our leader." It was read by a presenter. And it was uh, signed, if you will, uh, Uday Saddam Hussein. A couple of other stations uh, just playing songs, local stations just saying songs, some of them in praise of President Saddam Hussein. The Quran was aired on another one, and another radio was broadcast in Iranian, uh, in Persian uh, language. Now, some of the music has been indeed also broken up by various declarations of uh, resistance. Uh, to the uh, foreign aggression, as they call it, pledges of allegiance to President Saddam Hussein, uh, singing, even chanting, Iraq will defend itself with all its might. And just now, we've heard a voice on Iraqi radio. Uh, it seems to be the voice of a Minister of Information, Mohammed Saeed al Sahaf, talking about the battle in which Iraqis will emerge all powerful, calling on Iraq's sons members of the Ba'ath Party to have faith, ending almost toward the end, saying, victory is yours, it is certain, it is certain, it is certain. Let me just uh, put back uh, Nick for the, Nick Robertson, our senior international correspondent here for the uh, rest of the coverage here from Baghdad. Christian, indeed, it does appear at this time that uh, U.S. forces have not interrupted any of the radio services, the regular Baghdad radio services that we are able to pick up here at this time. We are obviously monitoring the radio stations here very closely. I think one interesting uh, perspective on this target of opportunity is targeting President Saddam Hussein. We saw yesterday rumors that uh, Vice, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister Tariq Aziz had perhaps been killed, injured, or had defected. Within half an hour of those rumors being broadcast internationally, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister was appearing on Iraqi television, on international television, talking about a psychological war, saying that there would be, saying that there would be many more rumors like this. This psychological campaign that the Iraqi leadership feels that it is under here is something, uh, a pressure to which it, it does appear to uh, give into to a degree to respond and show 
that uh, these particular people, uh, the deputy prime minister, for example, who have been who who have been perhaps rumored to be dead or removed from the country, uh, they seem to want to stop those uh, rumors quite quickly. It will be interesting to see at this time whether or not the Iraqi leader chooses to do the same thing, Christian. Nathan, have you been able to hear over the last couple of hours since this started any of the aircraft activity overhead? I know you spoke about the initial, uh, the initial uh, anti-aircraft fire, but have you heard any American aircraft? Indeed, we, we have not been able to see or hear any aircraft flying over here. There is uh, almost uh, nine-tenths cloud cover over the city, very difficult to see anything. We certainly haven't heard anything. There have been uh, a number of detonations coming from the southern side of the city, perhaps maybe 10, 15 kilometers towards the south side of the city. Difficult to judge the distance, difficult also to judge whether or not this is heavy anti-aircraft batteries or this is some kind of impact. But certainly from what we see in the city at this moment, uh, the anti-aircraft gunfire is not firing in the city at the moment and uh, there is uh, an increased flow of traffic on the streets at this time, although many of the vehicles we see are government vehicles that are moving around at this time, Christian. All right, Nick, thanks, and obviously we'll be back to you. Wolf? Christian, uh, we could not report CNN that uh, we see CNN has confirmed that more than 40 cruise missiles were fired from various locations uh, in the Persian Gulf at these targets of opportunity, as they're called, the, these two, at least two selected targets uh, that uh, President Bush spoke about. I want to bring in the former Defense Secretary, William Cohn, who served during the Clinton administration, uh, the former Defense Secretary, also a former senator. When you hear of the, this initial burst of, acti of activity, Secretary Cohn, what goes through your mind? Well, several things. Uh, number one, if it was in fact uh, a decapitation attempt, uh, a target of opportunity as such, it raises certain questions that Saddam will have to take into account. Number one, uh, was the president acting based upon inside information? In other words, are there sources inside of Baghdad close to Saddam Hussein who are feeding information to our intelligence services or saying things that would lead the president to believe that Saddam and his uh, cohorts are going to be in a specific location? That should be very disconcerting to Saddam uh, to feel that he uh, may have uh, traitors uh, in his own uh, circle of, uh, of advisors. Uh, number two, uh, it also sends a signal that uh, the uh, the Iraqi forces are going to be subject to uh, uh, attack from uh, great distances that they cannot strike back. That will have a very demoralizing impact. Uh, and uh, number three, I think that uh, they're waiting now for the, uh, the rolling thunder or the shock and awe campaign to begin will also have its psychological consequences for those uh, in, in Baghdad and other um, urban areas. Secretary Cohn, when you hear about this effort to decapitate the Iraqi leadership, that's a euphemism for trying to kill Saddam Hussein. Based on your understanding what the executive order is, what the U.S. standing policy is, is that acceptable in this kind of military circumstance? Oh, I think it is. Uh, we are now in a state of war. Uh, Saddam Hussein is the commander-in-chief. Uh, of the forces that are arrayed against the United States and the Allied forces. And I think that he is a uh, fair game, he and all in the chain of command, as well as all of the soldiers beneath him. So, yes, I think that uh, he can and uh, it will be targeted to the extent that we have specific information. So, uh, the war has begun, and uh, he is uh, the leader of those forces and is subject to, uh, to all attack. Right. And, Secretary Cohn, we just sh showed our viewers, and maybe we can show it again. Pentagon has just released some of, of initial video from this initial burst of uh, strikes uh, against the selected targets in Iraq. We can see it right now. Uh, looks like a cruise missile being launched. Uh, as you well know, these cruise missiles are very accurate. Uh, tell our viewers a little bit about the effectiveness of this cruise missile if, in fact, they were fired at a selected target, a leadership position, a command and control facility in Baghdad. How good are these missiles? Uh, these missiles are so precise uh, that uh, they can hit uh, from uh, great distances a target uh, within just a few meters, uh, so-called uh, 
a circular area of probability. Uh, within a few meters of uh, the target itself, they can uh, strike and, and devastate that target. So they're very, very precise. Uh, they uh, are programmed uh, to hit a specific target and do so uh, almost without fail. Sometimes there are mishaps. Sometimes they may go astray. And that is always a concern when you're firing into an urban area. But for the most part, they are extraordinarily precise. All right, stand by for one second. I want to bring in our senior Pentagon correspondent, Jamie McIntyre. Jamie, it looked like that videotape that we just saw was a, a cruise missile being launched from a warship. It looked like from a destroyer that was about to go on its target. But what can you tell us about this video? Well, that video was released. This shows one of the difference, Wolf, between now and the Gulf War. That video was taken on one of the U.S. ships that took part in this cruise missile attack. More than 40 missiles were fired. Uh, this was taken on a ship in which uh, U.S. reporters were <laughs> embedded, is the term they keep using. Uh, and it was <laughs> emailed, excuse me, emailed back to the Pentagon and released here a short time ago. So really, just in a short time afterwards, we were able to see the actual launch of some of those 40-plus missiles that were targeted at at least two targets in the Baghdad area. The Tomahawk missile has a range of about 1,000 miles, uh, and it is satellite-guided. Uh, so unlike in the Gulf War when they had to have terrain uh, <laughs> features to guide by, they can guide these by satellite, they can come in from all different directions uh, and be timed to hit precisely at the same time at one target. So um, that's why it's a weapon of choice here. And again, also F-117s took part in this attack, presumably on one of the other targets. You know, I've heard it often said, and Jamie, I know you have as well, that one of these cruise missiles can be fired, let's say, uh, from Washington, D.C. Let's say the target is uh, Yankee Stadium in New York City in the Bronx. It can be programmed to go up the eastern coast, go into New York City, go into uh, Yankee Stadium, and actually go and, uh, into center field if, in fact, that is the specific target. It could be that precise. Is that a That's fair right. analysis? A absolutely correct, Wolf. And I should have mentioned, by the way, I've neglected to, that this video we have is actually from, uh, you are correct, a uh, U.S. Navy destroyer, the USS Donald Cook, uh, one of the ships that took part uh, in the strike tonight. Uh, um, so that's the, uh, that's the actual video that we're showing. Having been aboard those destroyers, when I used to have your job at the Pentagon, I'm familiar with them. That's why it looked like a destroyer. Jamie McIntyre at the Pentagon, thanks very much. Uh, Aaron, back to you. Thank you, Wolf. Just... Um if we can, uh, rack that tape one more time. Um, these are the little moments of history. In fact, someday you will look at this tape and say, this is the moment when the war with Iraq, the second Persian Gulf War, the disarmament of Iraq, as the president referred to it, this is the moment it began. These are the pictures to prove it. John King at the White House. John? Aaron, on this very point, you heard both Wolf and Jamie talking about, and Christiane talking about some of the difficulties in the last Gulf War about launching attacks in Baghdad, some civilian casualties that proved quite controversial. One official here in providing some information on the dramatic developments today used this term. He said this is not his father's military, meaning this president is very confident about the military's capabilities to deliver strikes inside Baghdad while keeping civilian casualties to a minimum. More, a bit of the drama of the president's day. We told you the war planning meeting are now twice a day, but it was at an extraordinary extra meeting late this afternoon after the second war planning meeting. We are told for f almost four hours, from 3.40 until 7.20 p.m. in the Oval Office, the President, the Vice President, Defense Secretary Rumsfeld, CIA Director George Tenet, National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice, they came to see the President urgently because we are told there was concern in the CIA and at the Pentagon that a target of opportunity might be lost. We are told the president actually gave the go-ahead at 6.30 p.m., 50 minutes before that meeting broke up. At 7.20 p.m., after the meeting broke up, he stopped to see his speechwriter, Mike Gerson, his chief speechwriter, to tell Mike Gerson there would be an announcement later tonight, time to get to work. At that point, Mr. Bush left and went to the residence. He had what we are told is a relaxing dinner with the First Lady. At 8 o'clock, Andy Card, his chief of staff, came to say the NSA and the CIA had confirmed Saddam Hussein was still in the country, that he had not accepted the president's ultimatum. Then around 9.30, 9.45, Mr. Bush returned to the Oval Office, put the finishing touches on that speech. 10.15 tonight, in an address to the American people, the President of the United States announcing the war was underway. At this hour... American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. On my orders, 
coalition forces have begun striking selected targets of military importance to undermine Saddam Hussein's ability to wage war. These are opening stages of what will be a broad and concerted campaign. The president went on to say the United States would use maximum force to achieve its objectives. One senior official I spoke to a short time ago said the best intelligence information at the moment is a much larger scale operation is still at least 12 hours away in the word of this official. However, he also said the president, as he did tonight, reserves the right to act more quickly if any information comes to his attention. At this hour, Aaron, as we analyze the early hours of this, Mr. Bush has returned to the residence. We are told he is headed to bed. Vice President Cheney, National Security Advisor Rice, all also gone home, but of course the White House Situation Room, the nerve center here in the west wing of the White House, staffed 24 hours a day because of the advances in technology, in touch with every one of those forces, the deployed forces, every one of those vessels positioned around the Persian Gulf. Aaron. Yeah, John, in terms of the news, is the lid on now at the White House? Has the, has the uh, information lid gone down? Yes, it had. We are told no new announcements from the White House at all tonight, and there are no public events on the president's schedule tomorrow. He does have dinner tomorrow night with a member of this coalition of the willing, if you will, and if we want to flash back a few days, one of the contested votes on the United Nations Security Council, the president of Cameroon, is due to be here tomorrow night to have dinner with the president. We will see how tomorrow unfolds. Uh, in so many respects, John, we'll see how tomorrow unfolds. Thank you. Senior White House correspondent John King. Just a quick point on something John mentioned uh, at the beginning of his reporting there. Uh, it is a very different military than the first Gulf War. It is a much smaller force that is in the region, but it is it has much smarter, if you will, much smarter weapons than it had, far more smart bombs, and the smart bombs themselves are much more sophisticated, many satellite GPS-guided weapons. Uh, it it allows the military to be far more precise and to operate, it hopes, certainly that's the battle plan, far more successfully with fewer people, uh, fewer people on the ground, fewer foot soldiers, and, and, the, and, and it, it stands to reason then fewer risks of casualties. But as the White House also made clear today, Americans need to pre prepare themselves for the possibility of casualties as this unfolds. One of the concerns is that there will be a flood of refugees, people trying to get out of Iraq. It's, we have seen some of that in both the north, particularly in the north, but some in the south as well. Jane Araf is in northern Iraq and has seen some of that along the Turkish border. Jane? Aaron, we're overlooking the city of Doe Hook behind us, and our location actually is Doe Hook is one of the biggest cities in northern Iraq. As you mentioned, they've seen a flood of people here, not the refugees they expected. Those potential refugees would have been coming from the rest of from the rest of Iraq. These ones actually are Kurds moving into the mountainside that has caused what humanitarian officials say here is a crisis. Two people have already died of exposure. Now the city is at the foot of a mountain. The mountain overlooks. The, it looks towards Mosul, Iraq's second biggest city, and there are Kurdish military there. Select groups of American military are known to operate. They're there this morning, apparently. And just a few kilometers away is actually the checkpoint where any potential refugees would come over, as well as surrendering Iraqi soldiers. We were there early this morning at the checkpoint that divides Iraqi-controlled territory with Kurdish-controlled territory. The border guards are monitoring the border, but they haven't seen anyone cross yet. But officials here have made preparations for thousands of soldiers coming across, as well as tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of refugees. Aaron? And just give me a sense of how far you are from the border with Turkey and talk about the concerns that both sides of that border, the Turks and the Kurds, have about that piece of real estate that you're standing on. That had been very much a concern, as you know, the prospect that Turkey would send Turkish troops into northern Iraq, Iraqi Kurdistan. That seems to have been diffused somewhat. Now, we have been up in the mountains with the Kurdish Peshmerga, Peshmerga, those who face death, they're legendary fighters. And in the past two weeks, as soon as Turkey started seriously talking about sending troops into northern Iraq, these fighters were deployed. We saw five battalions of them, about 5,000 fighters deployed in the mountains directly near Turkey. Now, the United States has been trying to play a mediating role, as you know, Aaron, trying to make sure that things do remain calm, that there's no conflict here. And the Kurds believe that they have an agreement that Turkish forces will not be deployed. Now, Turkey has said it needs to deploy these people to prevent any humanitarian crisis, to stem a wave of refugees. 
people here, Kurdish officials say thank you very much. They can handle that quite well themselves. Aaron? Jane, thank you. Jane Araf, who is in uh, um, Kurdish-controlled part of northern Iraq. It is the one part of Iraq that Saddam and his regime uh, has not controlled. Uh, it is a very complicated ethnic political situation in that part of the country that, as Jane indicated, impacts Iraq, impacts Turkey on the other side. It was very much part of why this negotiation with Turkey was so complicated. Uh, that, uh, and even uh, 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 as recently as yesterday, the United States government made clear that it would not look kindly on Turkey if Turkey sent its troops into that area. But both sides, the Kurds and the Turks, um, have a difficult relationship, and that is one one part of why the ultimate occupation and the recreation of Iraq is going to be such a complicated and expensive and likely long-term enterprise for the United States. Nick Robertson in Baghdad. Nick, what do the people of Baghdad know? What have they heard from either their government or anyone else to this point? Well, there was a brief broadcast earlier on by uh by Information Minister Mohammed al Sahaf, Perhaps the main broadcast or the first broadcast people will have heard here today was a broadcast uh, from a radio station broadcasting a message from President Saddam Hussein's son, Uday Saddam Hussein, saying, God protect the people of the country, God protect our leader. Um, we are also expecting a news conference within the next, within the next hour to be given by uh, Information Minister Mohammed al Sahaf. We have not been able to hear on Iraqi ra on any of the normal Iraqi radio station or radio station frequencies here. We have not heard any uh, U.S. broadcast. We have not heard any radio stations here that appear at this stage, at least, to have been taken over uh, by uh, U.S. broadcasts. What is happening, uh, or at least what appears to be happening, uh, a ratcheting up of the pressure on Iraq's leadership here to say that the pre President Saddam Hussein was a target of opportunity to put it to uh, the Iraqi people that perhaps their leader is dead. This is something that will put pressure on the leadership, pressure on the leadership here to deny it, pressure to prove it's wrong, pressure to tell the people that uh, President Saddam Hussein is still firmly in control of the country, Aaron. It's about 7.20 in the morning now, on a Thursday morning. Um, is there any, I'm not sure, Nick, to be perfectly honest, I'm not sure what you can and cannot see as opposed to what you can hear. Why don't you tell us what you can see and is there any sense of normalcy, any sense that the city is coming alive uh, for a Thursday morning? It's certainly not coming alive for a normal Thursday morning. I'm on the 11th floor of a hotel. I'm overlooking the Tigris River that sweeps for several miles uh, east, uh, east and west of me at this point. I'm looking across to a government uh, part of the city. I can see the information ministry from where I stand. I can also see the main, uh, some of the main boulevards in the city. There are occasional vehicles going up and down the road. The majority of vehicles that we've seen from this location so far, a tiny handful of taxis, many of them are government vehicles. Uh, no sign of soldiers out on the streets here at this time, but then no signs of, uh, no signs of normal life. The stores are closed. There are vehicles parked at the side of the road. The vehicles that came out earlier on, some of them were screeching around the corners trying to get wherever they were going in a hurry. Um, but the only other vehicles, apart from the government vehicles and a couple of taxis, are a few uh, vehicles belonging to television news agencies. They are marked in, in bold letters, TV, to indicate uh, that they belong to television news organizations. Those vehicles also driving around the city. Very quiet. Uh, there's no wind at this time. The palm trees that line the river here uh, are hanging limply. The visibility is not typical for this city. The visibility is quite limited at this time. Still hazy. It seems some of the dirt kicked up by the storms in the last few days is still in the air. And the skies overhead clearing a little, but still mostly cloudy at this time, Aaron. It is, uh, Nick, thank you. It is to look at it and to know. It is as if a, a terrible thunderstorm came through and passed, and now we are uh, waiting for a much larger typhoon to hit the city of uh, Baghdad and the rest of the country of Iraq. It will come, We, I think we can be fairly certain, first from the air, more cruise missiles, 40 already launched. But at some point, ground forces will move in, and the bulk of them will come in from Kuwait. They have, over the last several days, uh, units have moved much closer to the border. 
really kissing up against the border and they now stand there in the early morning 7 30 in the in the morning on a thursday waiting for the order to move whether that will come today tomorrow the next day uh, we do not know and will not speculate but we know walt rogers is there now walt Hello, Aaron. Another sign that the battle plan is unfolding here. Again, the U.S. Army is sitting in the extreme northern uh, edge of the Kuwaiti desert, very close to the Iraqi border. But the sign that the battle plan is unfolding on the horizon in that direction, about two miles, I can see tanker trucks moving up. These are the support vehicles which will refuel the tanks and the Bradley fighting vehicles when President Bush does give the order for the units to move forward. Let me share a bit of a charming vignette with you that you might enjoy, Aaron. Aaron, you sitting in the CNN studio and the CNN viewers in the United States and around the world actually knew about the attack on Baghdad, uh, the attempt to uh, assassinate Saddam Hussein before any of the soldiers here in the field knew about it. Everyone at the tip of the spear out there in their Bradley fighting vehicles, uh, they're so removed from the big picture which CNN is reporting that actually we here at CNN were reporting to the soldiers in the field what was happening that is the uh, airstrike and the cruise missile strikes against selective targets in Baghdad before any of the soldiers know it. They have a very focused mission out here. That mission is when the when the orders come to charge, they just fold up the back of those Bradley fighting vehicles, close the hatches on the M1A1 Abrams tanks and go forward. Uh, John King at the White House a short while ago said it could be yet another 12 hours before the command comes for these troops to move forward. That looks very accurate from where we are we would probably take two to three hours to move even now and we're the leading edge we're the cutting edge uh that is the seventh cavalry is the cutting edge here uh so it'll be at minimum two to three hours before we could roll forward even if the command came now and then beyond that uh john king was speculating 12 hours that looks fairly realistic over the horizon in that direction uh, back to the south is the huge uh, 3rd Infantry Division, mechanized infantry with, with uh, hundreds of tanks, um, uh, 155-millimeter Paladin guns. They have yet to be brought up. The 7th uh, Cavalry, the unit with which I've been embedded, is the scouting unit. We would be the first out uh, into Kuwait when, or excuse me, into Iraq, departing Kuwait. But again, the order has not been given to cross the line of departure. 7th Cavalry remains in its attack position, which is stationary. Aaron? Uh, just, Walt, as briefly as you can, when you walked over to these troops, when you walked over to them and told them what we had been reporting, that the, the strikes had happened, that the war apparently was on, how did they react? They were sort of dumbfounded, you know, sort of scratched their heads like, why didn't somebody tell us? Again, that's not their position to get the, the overall, the big strategic picture, which you're reporting so well back there. But our position here is very tactical. That is to say, these units, when they go forward, see only a very small tactical picture. An immediate objective, they follow a roadmap, and the roadmap for the 7th Cavalry is up to Baghdad. But again, uh, there's no indication, they had no indication this was coming, and even the officers in this unit were unaware of what was happening before you were reporting it to that big CNN audience. Aaron? Well, thank you. Walt Rogers in the desert, and we'll be seeing him a lot in the days ahead, we're certain. Um, much is now starting to unfold, though perhaps not all of it out uh, out on the water. The USS Lincoln, um, Kira Phillips is one of the embedded reporters out there. Uh, we're trying to get the pictures in. You can see the fighter jets. Um, there's some breakup, obviously. These are live pictures, and this is complicated technology. Um, Kira, are you able to hear me? Brian, or uh, Aaron, can you hear me, Aaron? Yeah, we, we are able to hear you barely. Go ahead. Okay, Aaron, as you're listening to me, Brian is on a, an F-14 Tomcat right now. I'm going to try and get the guys to uh, give you a salute. Uh, they just gave me the signal that they are headed off, uh, off the U.S. Abraham Lincoln here. I, I got to tell you, it's been a bit confusing because um, the plan was for the strike, of course, to start later in the day. Uh, and now everything has sort of been uh, jumped up at the last minute. As you know, the decapitation strike uh, uh, was attempted uh, earlier today. And now the F-14 pilots uh, are coming out slowly uh, to their uh, jet. Let me see if I can get them to wave. There we go. We got the uh, pilot. They give us a wave. Let's see if I can get them to re 
radio to give us a signal, Aaron, uh, from the back there. They basically gave me a thumbs up. Well, we... we uh, They're uh, watching the... Uh, it's hard to see them, but we... There we go. Did you see There that, we Aaron? did. We were able to see it there, and all we can do and say, and we know we speak for everyone, is we wish them safe flight and safe return. Kira, thanks. Nick Robertson in Baghdad. Nick? Aaron, indeed, just while we've been talking in the last few minutes, an announcer has appeared on Iraqi television saying that President Saddam Hussein will make an address to the nation, will make a speech in the next few minutes. The announcer has made that announcement several times in the last few minutes. It seems at this stage uh, the Iraqi government responding very quickly to the notion that this decapitation uh, attempt on the Iraqi leader, this target of opportunity, um, was unsuccessful. We are expecting that. That's what Iraqi television is telling its people at this time, to expect an announcement in the next few minutes from the Iraqi leader. We are watching the television here, and as soon as it happens, Aaron, we will bring you all the details. Well, and it's, it is important for a couple of reasons. It is important for the anyone in Iraq um, who might have designs on um, defecting, on surrendering, on uh, not fighting a war that's about to unfold, to know that Saddam Hussein and his leadership, this most feared of people, that his government is still intact and, and that there are consequences it, uh, perhaps awaiting. Um, and it's important, I suppose, for the Iraqi people to know that as well, that the government whatever they may think of it, that the government of Iraq is still in place and this decapitation effort, whatever it was, was not um, successful in an absolute sense. That is to say, if, if in fact Saddam Hussein appears on television and if it was designed to get him um, and if in fact these were not taped pictures, then uh, he is still alive. But we'll know that. We'll know that in 15, 20 minutes, half an hour, whenever he uh, goes on TV uh, and will translate what he has to say um, when, he, when he does. Uh, Wolf is, I, I think you want me to do this, Wolf is in uh, Kuwait. Wolf? Thanks, Aaron. Uh, I want to do a little bit more analysis now on the weaponry that was used in this initial attack against the selected targets in Baghdad, apparently, perhaps elsewhere as well. Joining us, our CNN military analyst, retired uh, Gen Ar U.S. Army General Wesley Clark, the former NATO commander, as well as the former Secretary of Defense, William Cohen. First to you, General Clark, uh, these uh, Tomahawk cruise missiles that were used, one of the great advantages of them is that they can be fired from a great distance away. They're very precise, and obviously they don't have any pilots involved. As a result, uh, no U.S. casualties are going to be inflicted. But in your experience with these Tomahawk cruise missiles, if they're going after a decapitation target, a specific group of leadership, how effective, how reliable can they be in this kind of mission? Well, they are, they are exceptionally reliable, and um, they do take time to program and plan the use, but obviously that was done, and they're very, very accurate. Now, uh, they have a particular warhead capability on them. Uh, they're good at certain types of targets. Other types of targets, they're not as good at. But for the targets that they're good at, they are very, very good indeed. And the thing you have to remember is because there is no pilot in there, you don't need to clean up the air defenses before you can come in safely. Uh, they could launch another strike. They could launch another strike after that. Uh, and if you place yourself in the mind of the Iraqis and ask, you know, what, what is this coming after us? Uh, we're talking about one decapitating strike. There could be a whole series of, of surprises in store for the Iraq leadership thanks to these cruise missiles. And Secretary Cohen, uh, as we uh, try to assess the role of the F-117A, these stealth fighters that were apparently used in this initial strike as well, uh, these are the strikes that are these are the planes that are supposedly invisible to radar. They were used very effectively during the first Pers Persian Gulf War, but I assume they've been dramatically improved over the past 12 years. Actually, they were used very successfully also in the war in Kosovo, in which General Clark was intimately uh, involved. Uh, they're nearly invisible. Uh, no uh, aircraft is fully invisible, but uh, the uh, near invisibility coupled with uh, nighttime capability makes them very, very difficult, if not almost impossible, to detect. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the avionics, no doubt, have been upgraded. Uh, the technology is actually quite old. These were uh, uh, fighter aircraft and bombers that were developed uh, way back in 50s and 60s technology. 
But uh, in, in terms of the avionics and the precision munitions, obviously that has been uh, substantially upgraded. But um, we uh, have a saying that the, uh, the, our Air Force owns the night, but we also will own the day. Uh, we will take down uh, their air defenses, and so within a matter of a few days, uh, it should be very uh, evident that these aircraft, uh, the, the non-stealth aircraft as well as the stealth bombers, will be flying uh, with, without much of a threat other than artillery being uh, rained upon them from below. But uh, we should own the skies both day and night soon. And Secretary Cohn, as you were speaking, we were showing our viewers the Department of Defense video that was released from that destroyer where the, that cruise missile w was launched from a destroyer. We're not sure where that destroyer is, whether it's in the uh, Red Sea, whether it's in the Persian Gulf, where it was. But uh, this is part of the combined strategy. The Navy directly involved, the Air Force, the Army, the Marine Corps, the Coast Guard as well. Uh, l let me bring back General Clark. As you t take a look, at the improvements in, in all branches of the U.S. military working together under General Tommy Franks, the commander of the Central Command, the chief uh, planner of this operation. Things have improved dramatically as far as cooperation between the various branches of the U.S. military. They, they really have because we've had a number of experiences where we've learned our lessons the hard way. I mean, we, we learned an enormous amount from the first Gulf War. And it, after that, we recognized that all the services had to have precision weaponry. In Kosovo, we learned the importance of the Army and the Air Force and the Navy working together. We learned to plan big operations. We put that practice uh, into effect in Afghanistan, where we took the unmanned aerial vehicles and we linked them in with better command and control to the strike targets. And we put special operations forces on the ground to help guide the weaponry. And all of those lessons are going to be uh, on display and going to be very, very effectively used here in this campaign against Iraq, Wolf. Secretary Cohen, uh, the F-117A is this stealth fighter we talked about uh, just a few moments ago, but there's obviously the B-2 stealth bombers, which have a significantly improved capability. No indication they've been used yet as far as any strikes, uh, as, as far as this initial burst of activity, military activity, but presumably they will be used. They've been moved closer to the theater as well. Uh, talk to our viewers a little bit about this B-2 and what they're capable of doing. Well, the B-2 uh, is capable of uh, flying all the way from uh, CONUS, or continent of the United States, all the way to uh, Iraq, being refueled uh, several times along the way. Uh, carrying uh, at least uh, 16 uh, precision-guided uh, bombs uh, that can hit their targets with uh, absolute uh, precision. Uh, and so they can uh, fly long distances. They have a very small crew of, uh, of two uh, and uh, uh, are enormously successful and have been successful in, in our campaigns. Not. I'm sorry. And, 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 uh, and I want to uh, just bring back uh, General Clark. Uh, those B-2s, they were, they were flying from the continental United States, but we're not told. They have been moved closer to the theater, to Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean, where they've got these hangars that can, that can accommodate the B-2. This is a dramatic development as far as this potential war is concerned. It is, Wolf, because this enables us to put more aircraft over the target area. The turnaround time is less, so the U.S. Air Force that's flying these aircraft is going to be able to turn the aircraft. It's going to save fatigue on the crew, and uh, so it, it's a real efficiency measure in terms of use of the aircraft. What do you think, Secretary Cohn, of this strategy that we now see unfolding here uh, in, in the past couple hours? And a limited military strike, Tomahawk cruise missiles, F-117A stealth fighters, but now an apparent pause as the U.S. prepares for the next wave of activity, a pause that presumably will result in Saddam Hussein, if Iraqi television and radio are correct, Saddam Hussein making a statement to his own people. Uh, what do you make of this strategy? Well, I, again, uh, much depends upon the information and intelligence that the president had at his disposal. Uh, he uh, obviously wanted to uh, take advantage of any opportunity he had to, uh, to launch a strike against Saddam and his uh, uh, in his inner circle. To the extent that uh, that was unsuccessful, that's the first shot. There are many more to come. Secondly, they may be waiting in terms of the sequencing of the forces, uh, in terms of the weather clearing, so that the ground forces can act nearly simultaneously along with the uh, helicopters, uh, low-flying helicopters, as well sure. as all of the precision uh, aircraft. So uh, it may uh, have to do with the, uh, the battle plan as such. This was simply a, a, an opportunity that was seized, may not have worked out, 
but it's uh, the shape of things to come, and the shape of those things to come, a very heavy uh, raining of uh, 3,000 or more missiles in a very short period of time with uh, combined air, land, and sea forces. All right, Secretary William Cohn, the former Defense Secretary, thanks very much. We'll be standing by speaking to you and General Clark as well, our CNN military analyst. Back to you, Aaron. Thank you. And we are hearing now from Iraqi TV that Saddam Hussein will, in fact, go on the air, address the country, whether that um, he has rarely, if ever, done live TV for security reasons, but he's going to make some statement on Iraqi TV, and we expect that shortly. But it has not, if I heard the, the information correctly, it has not happened yet. We are in an odd by our thinking at least, odd in-between moment where something has started. It is absolutely t correct to say that the war against Iraq is underway, but as former Secretary of Defense Cohn said, the shock and awe, this raining down of 3,000 or so cruise missiles that is the beginning of the massive battle plan, the sequencing to use the military term, has not yet started and may not start uh, for many hours to come. John King talked about 12 hours. Jamie McIntyre earlier talked 24 to 48 hours. And General Clark said that would neither be a problem nor a particular surprise. They want to do this on their time when it is, when the weather is best, when everything is in shape, when all of the ships and all of the planes and all of the soldiers are ready to go. John King's at the White House. John? Well, Aaron, the senior official who spoke, uh, who I spoke to a while ago who did say he thought it would be about 12 hours, perhaps more, before you would see any major military operation underway, I asked what would happen in the meantime. This official said we will watch, we will listen, and we will learn. So certainly more developments to come. Quiet here at the White House now after a dramatic day, the signature moment of the Bush presidency, of course. And as we watch daybreak in Baghdad and as we have an apparent lull in the military activities, I want to bring back some of the words the president did speak earlier tonight. He said that a selected targets had been attacked tonight, but the president also warned the American people, in his words, that this could go longer and more, could be a longer and more dangerous operation than many had predicted. In this conflict, America faces an enemy who has no regard for conventions of war or rules of morality. Saddam Hussein has placed Iraqi troops and equipment in civilian areas, attempting to use innocent men, women, and children as shields for his own military, a final atrocity against his people. Mr. Bush promised to use the full might and the full resources of the United States military in prosecuting this war. And as we wait to see what the next phase is, we obviously are focused on the tactical things before us, the attack tonight, the battle damage assessment, whether Saddam Hussein or any major Iraqi leaders were in fact killed in that strike. Also, though, Aaron, as we watch daybreak in Baghdad, it will be interesting as day breaks in other key capitals around the world. This war and this president's policy of preemption is quite controversial around the world as he prosecutes this war and issues the key orders in the hours and days to come. He also will have to deal with significant political fallout around the world. And one of the things that all of us will be watching beyond the military uh, uh, plan that unfolds is how will it unfold in the streets of Arab capitals and... Um, in truth, how it's going to unfold in the streets of the United States. We went to, as a country, to a higher state of alert the other night after uh, the president's ultimatum. And there is, as you know, enormous concern about homeland security and the relationship between a possible terrorist attack in this country. What Jean Meserve, who covers such matters for us uh, the other night, chillingly, to our ear, chillingly described as almost certainty uh, an attempt at a terrorist attack. Uh, Kira Phillips is on the USS Abraham Lincoln um, this morning, at least this morning for her. Kira? Eric, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I hear you good. Go ahead. All right, I apologize. As you can imagine, it's really hard to uh, hear you and even hear myself here on the flight line. The uh, F-14 that you just saw uh, take off, I'm not going to give you full names at this point. I'm going to stick with call signs. That was Crunchy and Rico taking off in that jet. Uh, prior to that, it was Tonto and Sully, the first jet to launch off the USS Abraham Lincoln as this uh, campaign against Iraq uh, has begun. This is what I can tell you right now. Operation Southern Watch is still in effect. These jets that are launching off the USS uh, Abraham Lincoln 
are conducting regular operations with uh, Operation Southern Watch. Of course, at any moment, those jets could be called in to fly over Baghdad. As you know, uh, Aaron, this is a very difficult time for me right now because there's a lot of information that I know, a lot of classified information, and so I've got to be really careful about what I say right now. But what I can tell you is that things are in full swing right now. Uh, F-14s are the first strike uh, fighter pilots to launch off the U.S. Abraham Lincoln. You can see the other aircraft uh, getting ready, uh, uh, loading up, getting ready to go. The radar jammers, the prowlers have also uh, launched off the USS Abraham Lincoln. Um, I've got to stick to pretty much uh, the basics right now. I can tell you uh, there'll be what's uh, heading over uh, Baghdad, Aaron. They'll be going for pretty obvious targets, uh, military targets, uh, government buildings. You know about the uh, decapitation airstrike that already took place uh, with the hopes of getting Saddam Hussein before uh, additional bombs had to be dropped. But at this point, uh, that's what I can tell you. Right now, F-14s uh, in full force, the uh, Tomcatters, launching off uh, the USS Abraham Lincoln right now uh, as this conflict with Iraq has begun. Aaron? Kira, thank you very much. Kira Phillips is aboard the USS Abraham Lincoln. Um, and just to do a bit of translating, if I can, some of that, I mean, this is a remarkable technology that allows uh, these correspondents to file from the middle of, of oceans, from remote places in northern Iraq, from the Kuwaiti desert. Um, and sometimes it's not a perfect technology. As I heard her, these are the routine flights that have been going on for some time into southern Iraq, into the no-fly zone of southern Iraq. There has been an increase in these, a 30% or more increase in these in recent weeks as they soften up, if you will, uh, the air defenses in that part of Iraq. Uh, this is, this is, has been going on in many respects for years but it has gone on far more intensively in recent weeks. And that's what these, it, these planes are involved in. They are not yet involved in what the president referred to as the broad attack that will begin in some, at some point, um, some point today or some point tomorrow, at some point of the U.S. military's choosing when the military decides the time is right. In Kuwait for us now is Christiane Amanpour. Christiane? Aaron, as you know, the United States had hoped to have two fronts, not only the front leaving from Kuwait here, but also a northern front from Turkey. That wasn't possible because the Turkish parliament voted against, so far, allowing U.S. troops to be based there. In any event, she, CNN's Jane Araf is in northern Iraq, quite close to the Turkish border. Jane, what is going on over there, and do the Kurds expect to make any move down towards Baghdad or indeed towards any of the strategic targets around your area, for instance, oil fields and the like? Roughly. Well, again, we just talked about some of the extraordinary technology that we've been using around this uh, area as we try to bring you all the news. Jane was coming to us by video phone from Dohuk in northern Iraq, but we seem to have lost that capability right now. We'll get back to it as soon as possible. In the meantime, Walt Rogers is one of our correspondents who comes to us via satellite dish in Kuwait with, uh, I believe it's the cavalry there. Walter? Hello, Christian. Nice to talk to you again. The situation here with the 7th Cavalry along the northern Kuwaiti border with Iraq, we should tell you, is no change of plans. Despite the selective airstrikes uh, against Baghdad, an army source told me a short while ago, this is not meaning, this does not mean there will be any hastening of the ground movement forward at this point. The 7th Cavalry is in what's called an attack uh, position, but it has not received orders to cross um, the, the, the line of, uh, of uh, departure yet. What that means is that the Army is going to be sitting here probably at least another 12 hours. Uh, they have a plan. That plan was to hold back until they got orders from the Pentagon, orders from the White House. Nothing that happened in Baghdad has changed that plan at all. Uh, it would take at least three hours if the orders came through uh, immediately, right now, for 
for this unit to move forward, uh, and there's no indication it's going to come. Again, an, an, a soldier with whom I spoke a short while ago said the, uh, the orders remain very constant here. Again, they have not changed their plan. Some speculation is could be at least another 24 hours before the huge land armada, which is sitting over that horizon back there, the uh, uh, third uh, mechanized infantry division, the third division of the U.S. Army, will be coming forward. There was one uh, indication that the time is drawing closer earlier along the horizon. We did see um, 5,000 gallon tankers. Those are needed, of course, to fuel the tanks and the Bradley armored fighting vehicles. They're moving close to us, but we are with the 7th Cavalry, and the 7th Cavalry is the leading edge of an attack. No indication that attack is coming soon. Despite what happened in Baghdad, the Army says their orders remain the same. They are to sit in this extreme uh, northern position up against the Iraqi border, but not to go forward. Christian? Walter, thanks. And of course, Walter had mentioned that the unit that he's with there didn't even know that the opening stages of this campaign had begun because each uh, unit that the reporters are with have their own narrow field of vision there. We're going to go again now to northern Iraq and try to get hold of Jane Araf, who's in Doha. And as we were saying, the Americans had hoped to use northern Iraq as a northern front. That has not yet been possible. Jane, is there any indication about what is expected from where you are and whether the Kurds or any kind of military activity is expected, particularly to move down towards any of the oil fields or any of the strategic locations in the north? Well, Christiane, the Kurdish military has been operating in the airfields and uh, along positions, obviously, along the Turkish border and the Iraqi border, along with select groups of American military. Just behind us, and as you pointed out, we're in the city of Dohuk, one of the major cities in northern Iraq, and the closest Kurdish-controlled city next to Mosul, the second biggest Iraqi city. And there is a, a mountain that's a lookout point for Kurdish military. American soldiers are believed to be known to be there as well. Now, the big fear, of course, of Kurdish officials and the Kurdish military has been Turkish troops coming in. That seems to have been diffused for now, but there are millions of Kurdish Peshmerga, those are fighters who uh, literally translated as those who fear death, ranged along the Turkish border. Now, they say, obviously, they are prepared to fight Iraqi forces, but so far there's no sign of Iraqi forces here along the line of what would be the front line. Iraqi government-controlled territory a few kilometers away. So all quiet, they say. Jane, thanks. And you're breaking up just a little bit, so we will come back to you a little bit later as we continue to monitor this situation from various vantage points around Iraq and inside of Iraq. And right now we're going to go back to Aaron in Atlanta. Christiane, thank you very much. Uh, we're waiting for a statement from the Iraqi president, Saddam Hussein, that we expect to see on Iraqi television shortly. We saw a moment ago that the Spanish Prime Minister Anzur would uh, be addressing uh, the people in his country. Spain was one of the co-sponsors of the resolution that never was that uh, second resolution at the UN but he has been a staunch supporter of President Bush's and the policy and was with the president in the Azores uh, for that summit with uh, uh, Prime Minister Blair on Sunday and he'll talk to his um, his people uh, as well. Jamie McIntyre is at the Pentagon. Jamie. Well, Aaron, just to recap a little bit about what we know here as we've been piecing this all together throughout the night, uh, this was a Tomahawk cruise missile strike and a strike by F-117 stealth fighters at targets in Baghdad and, uh, and south of Baghdad. Here we see one of the cruise missiles fired from the USS Donald Cook, which was in the Red Sea. Uh, there were also missiles fired from a submarine in the Red Sea and an Aegis cruiser in the Persian Gulf. More than 40 cruise missiles uh, total were scheduled to be launched in this attack. Jamie, I need to interrupt you here. Nick Robertson, what are you hearing in Baghdad? Aaron, the air raid siren going off here again in Baghdad. This is about two hours and 20 minutes after the initial air raid siren went off. From what I am told here, uh, this is an air raid siren not uh, giving the all clear, but an air raid siren warning that a raid is coming. The siren there. 
Well, and it actually, just we, winding down, just winding down as I speak to you, Aaron. Well, we yeah, but we were actually, Nick, we were able to hear some of that as we were able to hear uh, some of the anti-aircraft fire uh, a couple of hours ago. Uh, just stay on the line, and we're probably 10 minutes or so away from hearing whatever the Iraqi president has to say. Um, Jamie, I interrupted you abruptly, I hope not rudely. Uh, why don't you go ahead and pick it up where you were? Well, I was just saying, we saw some of the cruise missile strikes that were launched. Uh, in addition, F-117 stealth fighters. Uh, this was what, we, what one Pentagon official called a target of opportunity, a location where it was believed that very senior Iraqi leadership was located, including, uh, an official says, Saddam Hussein. The hope was that they would be able to uh, take out some of the Iraqi leadership, including perhaps Saddam Hussein, and uh, vastly simplify the task of trying to prosecute this war against Iraq. Um, at this point, we still don't know the results of the strike. Uh, it was something that was planned at, at the last minute, essentially signed off by President Bush at the White House this evening and carried out even though uh, the uh, plans for the start of the, uh, the war that was supposed to be a very robust start uh, did not call for those plans to start tonight. So, uh, ja Jamie, go ahead. Is, I'm sorry, Jamie, is the news lid on at the Pentagon? You know, the Pentagon never has a lid. It's not like the White House where they put a lid on and everybody goes home. At the Pentagon, people just kind of drift out at the end of the day. There's always somebody here. And for instance, unlike the White House where they kick the reporters out at a certain hour and tell them to go home, uh, you can stay here at the Pentagon all night. There's always somebody here. Now, let me ask the question. Let me come at it uh, in the opposite direction. Do you have any sense that in the next few hours, uh, we are going to be reporting from the Pentagon the beginning of a major operation. Is there any activity there that suggests to you that that's going to happen? No. In fact, we've been giving every indication that that's not going to happen, including, as I said, several senior officials who I've reached at home told me essentially they would not be at home if, they, if this was what they called, they're calling it A-Day. The first day of the war they've uh, tagged as A-Day, and uh, several officials told me, quote, this is not A-Day. Um, so just again, Jamie, the sense is that we could be many hours and very possibly a day or more from the beginning oh, yeah. of the shock and awe. Yeah, it's, it's very likely that when that happens, it'll start at night. Uh, in order to take advantage of the, the, the advantage the military has at night, the uh, cover that night uh, provides. Uh, and so I would expect that we're at least until the next nightfall before you'd see the begin of a major, uh, major bombing campaign that's supposed to have more than uh, 3,000 uh, cruise missiles and precision-guided bombs raining down on Baghdad uh, in, to create this uh, shock and awe. But again, if it turned out uh, that they had seriously damaged the leadership uh, and that something else happened in Iraq. They may want to wait and see what the effect is of this strike. Well, we're going to find out uh, possibly uh, uh, some of the effect of it in a few minutes when Saddam Hussein goes on TV, though. What we would expect, he'll, he'll appear on the TV channel that is uh, owned by one of his sons, Uday Hussein. Um, these speeches tend to be very full of verbiage. Um, certainly he will attempt to rally the country, rally the military. His mere presence is important in how this day plays out in, in Iraq. Um, it was just before 10 o'clock Eastern time that Nick Robertson began reporting. I guess it was probably closer to 9.30, 9.35 Eastern. Nick Robertson began reporting that there was anti-aircraft fire, um, some explosions uh, that he was able to hear. We have some tape of that now that we're able to look at. Um, if, we can, if we can put that up. the first time that we've seen these pictures you can see the explosions in the background in the distance it was just before daybreak in Baghdad you see the flashes in every 
earlier picture we had seen out of there, all we had been able to see was the anti-aircraft fire going up, the tracer fire going up to the sky. And so in just a span of 40 seconds, it's about how long that tape went, we were also able to see, as you look at Baghdad this morning, Thursday morning for them as we approach midnight here in the east, um, the first time we were able to see any thing that had come down, any explosions that had come down. As Jamie McIntyre has been reporting, two cruise missile uh, targets, one to the south of Baghdad, an attempt to, in the, in the jargon of the military, decapitate, go after the leadership of Iraq, a target of opportunity, uh, something, a decision the president signed off on um, early in the evening, 6.30ish, if I remember John King's reporting, 6.30 or so in the evening, he gave the go-ahead. Um, after the intelligence uh, came in. I'm sorry, go ahead, say that to me again. Okay, thank you. Uh, the president um, signed off early this evening, went back to the residence, talked to his speechwriter, said it is time to go to work, and go to work they did. 10.15 tonight, the president went on national television to tell the country that the opening stages, to use his words, the opening stages of the disarmament of Iraq was underway and made clear that it was simply that the opening stages of what will be a broad attack that will begin sometime down the road. Christian Amanpour and Wolf Blitzer are in, both in Kuwait City. This will be a central and important place over the next several days. Go ahead, Christian. Wolf um, and Aaron. Let's talk a little bit about the allies of the United States, Britain and Spain. We have been told, and certainly wire reports are saying, that Prime Minister Tony Blair was awoken, or at least okay. informed, after midnight British time that these attacks had been brought forward. We're not sure whether this was a surprise to him or not, but what we do know is consistent with what our reporters, Jamie McIntyre and others from the Pentagon have been saying. We believe that the British had not expected the full uh, initial launch of this war to begin uh, right after the deadline and uh, we are not sure when or whether we're going to hear from Tony Blair or indeed people at the British Defense Ministry so far they have given no statement about what's going on we understand that in Spain the Prime Minister of Spain Azna who is also an ally in this campaign although has not committed military forces is also going to address his people uh, as we know of course today there have been several activities out here in terms of military activities uh, US forces and British forces have attacked artillery batteries inside southern Iraq, those which were deemed to be threatening either to U.S. and British forces arrayed now in the demilitarized zone there or indeed against uh, Kuwait itself, neighboring Kuwait. And also what we've been reporting for much of this day was that 17 Iraqi soldiers had surrendered, according to U.S. Uh, officials, and apparently that being an, at least a, a small victory so far for the American PSYOPs operation which has been underway for so long and with so many millions of leaflets that have been dropped on the forces there urging them not to fight. And whether or not those uh, PSYOPs, those psychological operations, the leafleting of those millions of leaflets have an impact in convincing Iraqi troops to uh, give up, if you will, obviously remains to be seen. Now, I want to bring in CNN's Kira Phillips. She's aboard the USS Abraham Lincoln, an aircraft carrier uh, in the Persian Gulf. Kira, tell our viewers what you can about what you're seeing and what they're doing aboard that carrier right now. All right, Wolf, I can barely hear you, but uh, I'm going to try and give you as much information as possible right now. I can tell you that I can confirm that Operation Southern Watch is over. Right now, the strike fighters here on USS Abraham Lincoln and other supporting aircraft are in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom. Earlier, uh, about within 45 minutes ago, we showed you F-14s, uh, the F-14 Tomcatters launching off the carrier. Those pilots indeed in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom now. This conflict with Iraq is moving quicker. The tempo is building up. Right now, you're seeing a shot of an F-18 getting ready uh, to uh, launch off the U.S. Abraham Lincoln here. As you can see, it's an integration of a number of squadrons. The first to go were the F-14s. Now the F-18s are starting to get into the mix. Very interesting thing I might want to point here out on the F-18. You might uh, be able to pick it out, and that is the uh, bunker uh, busters. Uh, a lot of talk about the weaponry used uh, in this conflict with the rock. A lot of concern about collateral damage. Therefore, uh, a lot of effort has been put into JDAM. 
at GPUs and bunker busters. The hope is once these strikes take place, do I still have you? I, Wolf, do I still uh, go, have go you? Ahead, go, go, go ahead, Kira. I, you still have me. Okay, thank you. I'm hearing a little interference. I'm hearing, there we go. I'm hearing a little interference, and I apologize for that. I want to make sure that uh, I'm still with you here. Uh, once again, the concentration on uh, 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 special weaponry, precise weaponry, so that they will hit their targets and the explosion will be in more of a contained manner versus uh, a wider type of explosion with the risk of hurting innocent civilians. Therefore, that's why you're seeing the bunker busters, a type of weapon uh, on the F-18 that can drop deep and explode uh, deep within uh, the earth. Uh, on the F-14s, uh, the strike fighters uh, that took off uh, about 45 uh, minutes ago, they've got JDAM, GPS-guided uh, bombs. This is a new asset to the F-14 uh, Tomcatters here on the USS Abraham Lincoln. As you know, those bombs can drop through any type of weather, haze, dust, anything that could affect the laser bombs, the LGB laser-guided bombs. That's the other type of weapon uh, that the F-14s uh, have. Now, as uh, the F-18 squadron uh, gets ready to uh, integrate with the strike fighters that are already out there, I can tell you uh, within hours uh, we can see up to uh, more than 100 aircraft uh, in the air, depending uh, how the tempo uh, progresses. I can tell you that uh, a number of Iraqi threats, the uh, strike fighter pilots uh, told me they've been training for, paying attention to, uh, intelligence coming into them. Uh, plenty of time, of course, to uh, observe U.S. patterns. Uh, the Rockies have had plenty of time. So the element of surprise, as you can see, we're all surprised that this happens so quickly and is happening uh, in a manner which obviously nobody really expected. Even the squadrons here are learning by the minute uh, how this campaign is unfolding. Uh, I can tell you uh, a Rocky threat, SAM, surface to air missiles. The strike fighter uh, pilots will be paying close attention to that. Also, old Soviet fighters, the MiG-25, a very uh, favorite aircraft uh, with the Iraqi regime. They've been moving a lot of things around, we are told. Uh, the Iraqis have. There's a lot of dispersal that's been taking place. So the object uh, in this campaign, of course, is to be able to try and follow where all that movement is and be able to hit targets uh, uh, right, on, uh, right on top of the targets. Triple-A fire, uh, another concern uh, for strike fighter pilots. We'll be paying attention to that once they're airborne. Now, of course, uh, the perfect case scenario here was that Saddam Hussein uh, would uh, surrender. That obviously has not been the case uh, at this point. Uh, sorry, I'm getting information uh, as I'm talking to you here. Are you still with me, Wolf? I am, Kira. I just want to uh, update our viewers. Hold on one second. You were talking about something very significant uh, with the president formally announcing the start of what is now being called Operation Iraqi Freedom. What you, what you note that uh, the Southern Watch, Operation Southern Watch, Operation Northern Watch have ended. Those are the two no-fly zone operations patrolling the no-fly zone in the south, patrolling the no-fly zone in the north. That's been going on for nearly a dozen years. The Iraqis can't launch any kind of aircraft uh, in that southern no-fly zone or the northern no-fly zone. By and large, U.S. aircraft carriers in the Persian Gulf as well as bases, the Prince Sultana Air Base in Saudi Arabia as well as the Incirlik Air Base in Turkey responsible for launching U.S. and British warplanes to patrol the northern and southern no-fly zones. Uh, Kira Phillips once again aboard the USS Abraham Lincoln, one of five aircraft carriers now in the vicinity, now participation in Operation Iraqi Freedom. If you're still there, Kira, go ahead, tell us what you have. All right, Wolf, uh, are we, am I back with you, Wolf? Kira's uh, obviously not uh, hearing me or US? we're not hearing okay, her. We are you. seeing these live pictures what? via video what? phone from the USS Abraham me? Lincoln, an aircraft carrier in the Persian Gulf, uh, U.S. warplanes taking off F-14 Tomcats, F-18s, getting ready to participate in this, uh, in this Operation Iraqi Freedom, which is the name of the uh, U.S. military operation together with the British, a small Australian contingent as well. Aaron? Thank you. It's uh, just past midnight, eight past midnight in the east, a new day here in the United States, a day that uh, we expect to unfold dramatically, but...
precisely how is impossible now to know. Uh, we do know that Operation Iraqi Freedom is underway. We began to see that early, uh, earlier this evening, 940 or so this evening, when Nick Robertson reported it. Nick, what is it like in Baghdad now? I think day. And let's pay attention to that. Repeat. The president, the leader, the fighter, Saddam Hussein, may God protect him, and who is victorious, will shortly address with a speech, with an important speech, in this fighting day, in this great day. And let us pay attention to that. Now seeing that Saddam Hussein will shortly uh, will shortly go on TV and these are the pictures that is what Iraqi Iraqi TV I don't know if we can get back to that um, it is in in a sense a sort of remarkable scene that that normal TV programming is going on in Iraq as they await uh, the president of the country to announce that the country has been attacked by the United States Nick Robertson are you able to hear me now hear you just fine. Indeed, the uh, broadcaster giving the message that President Saddam Hussein will speak shortly, that's been playing here a number of times this morning. For about the last 40 minutes, that same message is being played out and broadcast to Iraqis here that their leader will broadcast a message to them so soon. Just as we were talking before, the air raid siren here went off again. I saw some people hurrying to get off the streets here. There are not many people around at the moment, but that was just 15 minutes be uh, after the all clear going off, the air raid siren going off, uh, and some people hurrying to get off the street siren. Although right now, nothing appears to be happening. Our, uh, Nick, our reporting uh, from the Pentagon, from the region, is that um, nothing major, the major rollout of Operation Iraqi Freedom um, is, is not going to happen yet. And uh, earlier, uh, uh, General Clark, I believe it was, talked about the value of starting in at night um, in, in the darkness. And we're a long way from that. It's just early morning now uh, in, in Iraq right now. Um, earlier, a short time ago, not, not very long ago, in New York, the Iraqi ambassador to the United Nations uh, talked to reporters um, how odd it must be to be the country's representative in the United States uh, when the United States has just attacked your country. Uh, but this is what he had to say earlier uh, in New York. Do our best to uh, contact, uh, uh, to tackle this matter within the United Nations and with the Security Council. What will be the next step to do that then? Hopefully tomorrow we will start that, uh, well, well, what that, that step. Exactly. Well, exactly what would you try and do? Well, uh, well, you know, just uh, uh, perhaps we have to send a letter there to, to the President of the Security Council and to the Secretary General. Uh, you know, this is a breach of peace. Uh, so uh, uh, we have to ask them to, uh, otherwise uh, we can do nothing new. Me, myself, I can, I can do nothing. I have just to tell the international community that the war is started, this is against the Charter, and this is the violation of international law. Mohammed al uh, there is an element to this, as there is in diplomatic matters, of almost uh, uh, scripting. Um, it, it was clear, it's been clear for days, that as soon as the Americans began the attack, the, the next day the Iraqis would go to the United Nations to protest that, to demand the Security Council take action on that. Michael Oku is one of our team of correspondents who covers the United Nations. He's been there a lot uh, over the last month or so. Michael, um, just run down the process that you expect to unfold over on the east side of New York in the next 24 hours. Well, Aaron, what we expect is that the uh, Iraqi ambassador who you just heard from will be very vocal about going to other Security Council uh, nations and asking them to convene to talk about uh, the action that the U.S. is obviously involved in at this moment. And uh, the word we are getting is that uh, it will really be more of a, a speech-a-thon of, of sorts, that essentially these ambassadors will come forward, uh, that they will, in their own words, uh, condemn uh, the U.S. Uh, and uh, U.K. action 
injunction here. Uh, we don't expect there to be any kind of a resolution or even uh, a, a presidential statement, which is what uh, often happens in situations like this. Uh, the advice uh, that uh, the Iraqi ambassador is getting, according to some diplomats we have spoken to, is that it is not a good idea right now uh, to try to uh, go too forward on this, to try to isolate the United States in any way, but to just come forward and to make their voices heard. Aaron? And uh, just finish the thought, Michael. The reason that he is being given that advice is that there is not that much support for the Iraqi position? Well, that's exactly right. There are quite a few uh, diplomats here who will tell you that they do not believe in the uh, U.S. action here, but they certainly do believe that Saddam Hussein may have weapons of mass destruction, that Saddam Hussein uh, may certainly pose a real threat in the area. But uh, it's really a matter, Aaron, of, uh, of uh, some diplomats uh, believing that uh, Mr. Hussein is dangerous, but the United States actions are not necessarily justified. And and it's really uh, sort of uh, trying to stay in the middle on this. Aaron? It was interesting, Michael, you said at the beginning that we expect to hear a lot of speech making at the United Nations. I think there are uh, a whole lot of people uh, who would say that's all we've heard from the United Nations over the last several months. And perhaps the president might agree with that. There's been a lot of speech making. When do they convene today? They convened earlier today. Of course, this was a meeting that was called for uh, by uh, France, Russia, and Germany. Uh, those three countries represented by their foreign ministers who came forward and uh, very vocally opposed uh, the, the U.S. actions here. Uh, the uh, German ambassador saying that uh, this is certainly not a time uh, to engage in war, continuing to say that the inspections process should uh, move forward. And in fact, they came here to discuss uh, the chief weapons inspector, Hans Blix is uh, obviously at this point last report to the Security Council that actually spelled out some of the key remaining disarmament tasks that the Iraqis uh, could uh, become engaged in and also it uh, detailed a work program for the inspectors. Uh, the uh, U.S. Ambassador John Negroponte coming out and, and in his own words, Aaron, essentially saying that it was ridiculous that as inspectors were leaving the country and that the U.N. was pulling back on this and that war was imminent, that uh, we would even be convening to uh, start uh, discussing a work schedule for the inspectors. So a lot of, uh, of uh, angry words there in the Security Council, which is something that we have seen quite a bit in the last uh, two months or so, Aaron. And someday when the history of all this all is written, Michael will have a better feel for the damage done, the scars left behind at the Security Council. Uh, Christiane Amanpour in Kuwait. Christiane? Aaron, we've been talking a little bit about what the soldiers know about what's been going on. We're going now to Walt Rogers, who is, you know, this term embedded with uh, an army division in northern Kuwait there. Walter, what are the soldiers there learning now? Christian, what you're looking at now is soldiers of the U.S. 7th Cavalry borrowing my shortwave radio, listening to the latest shortwave news on the attack on Baghdad earlier in the day. The soldiers you're looking at, many of them are tank commanders, uh, non-commissioned officers, sergeants, who will be driving the tanks north when the order comes to come forward. And they were caught off guard this morning. That is to say, they did not know that, the, uh, that Baghdad was about to be uh, the target of cruise missile attacks. I'd like to ask them now. Sergeant Wheatley, let me ask you first. Were you surprised when you heard that uh, the cruise missile attacks fell last night? Yes, sir. Very surprised. Happy? Um, alleviated, more or less. Glad for it to start. Glad for it to, the sooner it starts, the sooner it gets over. Sergeant Wheatley, what's it mean <clears throat> for your unit? Um, we've prepped for it for a long time. Most of us here have been together for over a year, and we're ready to go do what needs to be done. Sergeant Birdsong, same. Were you surprised when those cruise missiles slammed into Baghdad? I was surprised, but uh, at the same token, you know, not really surprised. We, we knew it was coming. Uh, I'm glad to see it started. But you, uh, sir, you sort of caught off guard. You were out there in your, in your vehicles, weren't you? When I, when I woke up this morning, uh, we heard the news. Uh, a little bit of surprise, you know, and what, trying to uh, wonder what the target was. Uh, just to... But overall, uh, all our guys are, are like, yeah, you know, just finally got started. We're, we're ready to go do what we got to do. Are you surprised you're not moving forward yet? No, not really. Due to the timeline the president's put out, uh, we have all been uh, brought up that the air will start first, 
and I'm glad it started to uh, start prepping for us to move. Sergeant Knight, how about you? You ready to go? Yes, sir, I am. Disappointed that the bombs, uh, the cruise missiles fell before you got your orders to move forward? No, sir. They need to do their part first, and then we come and finish. Uh, senior ranking officer here is Lieutenant Fritz. Is that right? Well, our commander's here. All right. Oh, well, there's Captain Lyle. Come on, Captain. Were you surprised by the cruise missiles falling this morning? A little bit. There's a target opportunity presented itself, so uh, the president acted. Lieutenant Fritz, West Point class of 2002, as I recall, right? Yes, sir. Were you surprised when those cruise missiles started slamming in before you got the orders to go forward? Absolutely. Anxious to go now? Ready to go. The hesitation. What's the hesitation? Hesitation. In your voice. You say ready to go. We're just ready to go. No, Captain Lyle, I'd like to ask you, what happens if your soldiers go forward and find Iraqis, civilians, being used as human shields? Uh, we uh, deal with the situation accordingly. Uh, we uh, definitely do not want to harm any non-combatants in any way. Uh, we're there to liberate those same people. Uh, so we take every precaution and uh, <clears throat> develop the situation as best we can to, to ensure their safety. Thanks very much. We've been talking to Captain Clay Lyle and the uh, soldiers of the uh, uh, 7th Cavalry, the Apache Troop. They are just catching up on the news this morning. Uh, they, like most of the uh, world, was caught a little bit off guard by virtue of the fact that the president had ordered a limited strike, a cruise missile strike against areas in Baghdad. The soldiers you're looking at will lead the attack for the U.S. Army when the orders come to come, go forward. But at this present time, there is no operational order to continue. So we're staying in the attack position with the 7th Cavalry. Christiane, back to you. Walter, now that the initial uh, stages have begun, of course, everybody is trying to figure out a timeline. What have you gathered in your time with those uh, soldiers there, with the 7th Cavalry Div Division, about a sort of timeline? For instance, when the major air assault begins, when is the ground assault scheduled? Well, nothing that happened in terms of that cruise missile strike on Baghdad, and it was a limited strike earlier in the day, nothing ha has changed the operational battle plan for this group, the 7th Cavalry. They have their orders. Uh, we can't say exactly when they're supposed to go forward, but I can tell looking at the readiness of the unit around me, these soldiers, they could move very quickly. The problem is the order has not come from the Pentagon yet, and the plan is not going to be changed by that limited cruise missile strike. So we're looking at least 12, 24 hours, perhaps even longer. The Pentagon, uh, the White House is not going to be rushed, and you can see that by the rather uh, laid-back position we see in the field. These soldiers could move very, very quickly. Uh, the men you see behind me, most of the men COs, could scramble on the top of their uh, uh, main battle tanks in, down in those turrets five minutes or so and be out of here, have those engines running. The problem for them, of course, is that the uh, that the order has not come forward. Now, we did have some supply vehicles, 5,000-gallon uh, and 2,500-gallon uh, tankers come up to bring more fuel or have fuel at the ready for the tanks when the order go comes to go forward. But the uh, uh, line of departure has not been crossed yet. That's still ahead of us back over there, over the Iraqi border. Back to you, Christian. Walter, thanks very much. And we go back to Aaron now at CNN headquarters. Christian, thank you. We were looking at Sergeant Wheatley. I didn't hear his first name, and maybe he didn't give it, but he was the first uh, first person Wald interviewed with the big mustache. Everyone who has ever been in the service knows Sergeant Wheatley, knows a non-com who looked like that, uh, that young man. And, and you look at those people, they are about to do some very difficult work in the days ahead, and all of us think of them and worry about them and wish them nothing but safety tonight. Uh, their commander-in-chief went on TV at 10:15 Eastern Time to announce what had become clear about a half an hour earlier that Operation Iraqi Freedom was underway. Chris Burns is now taking the watch at the White House. Uh, Chris, um, it was four minutes. The president's statement was four minutes, not very long, but it certainly said a lot about what's to unfold. Aaron, absolutely. And that decision that the president made was made uh, shortly before that. The president had a second National Security Council meeting, actually a war planning meeting in the afternoon. This had begun to happen this week, just this week. 
this second meeting rolled on longer than expected. And what really pricked uh, our ears up was w actually watching the fact that uh, Vice President Dick Cheney had spent an inordinate amount of time there at the meeting and had stayed there, an effort having been made since uh, September 11th, 2001, that both President and Vice President should not be together a very long time uh, to try to make sure that uh, leadership would survive in the event of another terrorist attack. So that was a very important indication that a big decision was on its way. President uh, Bush having made his decision, according to uh, senior administration officials, at 6.30 this evening. Uh, at 7.30, that meeting broke up. The president then giving his speech uh, at 10.15 this evening, uh, saying that uh, what was happening had only just begun. At this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. On my orders, coalition forces have begun striking selected targets of military importance to undermine Saddam Hussein's ability to wage war. These are opening stages of what will be a broad and concerted campaign. Now, the target having been made, the president decided because the CIA and other agencies had told him there was this opportunity to strike at a major leadership target. Now, the Pentagon sources are telling us that it was actually aimed at Saddam Hussein, but we can't confirm that from this end. What was important was that there was a major leadership target, try to cut he the head off the military leadership, and perhaps that would make it easier to advance uh, in the next few days. Aaron? Chris, thank you. Chris Burns, uh, I placed you at the White House. You are covering the White House. Uh, there comes a point, just so you know why Chris is not standing on the White House lawn, when the White House says we don't want any more uh, live shots coming out of the area. In part, is security. In part, it's because the lights are annoying to those people inside, honestly, who are trying to sleep. Uh, that would be the president and the first lady and any guests they might have. And so I gather that they... Um, that this is what happened, that they moved us across the street, and we uh, gladly oblige in that situation. Uh, the president is in the, in, in the residence. Uh, the first lady is there also. We haven't seen much of the first lady over the last several days, um, but we are told that while well, she didn't have a public schedule, uh, some friends had come to visit, and that they, this is obviously an important and difficult time uh, for the first family, and, and our thoughts are with them as well. Whatever feelings you have about the war and the appropriateness of it, um, um, the weight of these sorts of moments and the history of these sorts of moments on any president is important. And they are important moments, and our thoughts are with them as well. Uh, among the things that we'll be doing over the course of this war, however long it goes, and we all hope it doesn't go very long, is trying to explain the battle plan as it unfolds. Um, a lot of that duty will fall to Miles O'Brien and an assorted group, a distinguished group of analysts, generals, retired and otherwise. Uh, Miles is with us for the first time now uh, tonight. Miles, good to see you. Uh, good to see you too, Aaron. And I'm joined by Alec Fraser, who is retired uh, as a captain of a cruiser in the Navy and uh, has spent a lot of time, at least in training, firing off cruise missiles and can tell us a little bit about what goes on a naval ship at this time. First of all, Alec, good to have you with us. We do know this now, as we point out of the map here, we had uh, the uh, Red Sea and the Persian Gulf were the points of origin for some 40 cruise missiles. Um, and th we're talking about a range of between 700 to 1,000 miles for right. a cruise missile, so right. that's well within their capabilities. Tell us what goes on on a Navy ship when it comes time to fire off a cruise missile. To fire a cruise missile requires you to have a target, and that target is downloaded uh, from satellite pre-programmed targets. It's loaded into a mainframe computer on the, on the ship, and then when the target is assigned by the theater commander, that target is downloaded into the missile and then it is fired. So it takes about you know, 5, 10, 15 minutes to, to get the target loaded onto the missile, but the target is already available in the uh, mainframe computer system on the ship. Now, I'm told typically what happens is you're not, they don't fly like that, that arrow I've just put on there. They fly kind of a zigzag pattern typically as they come in. What's the purpose of that? Well, the beauty of a, a cruise missile is that you can have a lot of pre-fly points that you go to along the way, avoiding anybody being able to see the missile, being able to detect it and give an early warning. So you can fly the missile at various quadrants and at a target bring it in from various angles. So say someone's looking at a particular direction, 
it sees the missile coming in, but he doesn't see the one coming in behind him at the same time. All right, let's take a look at a flight of a cruise missile, just give you a sense of what uh, it might look like with a graphical depiction of it. Uh, this one would obviously be coming from the Persian Gulf as we depict it here. Comes off of a cruiser like that one, and on it goes. It, it comes off with a solid rocket motor and then shifts into basically a small jet engine flying right. at about here, 400, here's, 500 here's miles an hour. flying uh, above any other type of uh, things it could run into, then it drops down low once it gets over land. It'll fly to various points along the way. This one's flying straight. Uh, but it's, it's mapping as it goes along, taking some points and taking GPS coordinates at the same time. Low infrared signature, low radar signature, in other words, can't be picked up easily by defenses along the way. It has no emissions coming out from it, so therefore any type of electronic detection device doesn't work against it. How accurate are they? Which window would you like to fly it through? Really? Is okay. that, that, that accurate? When you're talking about 40 cruise missiles coming in, could they all come in simultaneously, perhaps? They could, and 40 missiles would not be fired by one ship. It could be fired by several cruisers. All right. You know what, Alec? Let's take a look at the air for just a moment. This is from the uh, USS Lincoln, where Kira Phillips is. We've been watching. Uh, that appears to be an F-18, perhaps a Super Hornet, uh, as they continue launching numerous sorties. Maybe we can listen in to Kira for a moment. Thank you, uh, Miles. Right now, uh, you're looking at the, uh, this is for the VFA 115 Squadron. This is the F-18 Super Hornet. As you know, there's been a lot of attention uh, on the F-18 uh, Super Hornet, the uh, newest strike fighter uh, to, the, uh, to the fleet here on the USS Abraham Lincoln. As you can see, uh, the flight deck crew giving the signals, getting ready to go. Here we go. The first F-18 Super Hornet. That was from the VFA uh, 115 Eagles has launched off the uh, USS Abraham Lincoln now. I'm Dumi Mahabo at the CNN Center. We'd like to take you now live to Baghdad, Iraqi television. The Iraqi information minister is speaking, perhaps ahead of President Saddam Hussein's address to the nation. Let's listen in. And to protect our people, the, Victoria, the, champion, the champions of Iraq, and the future of our Arab nation against the tyrant of this era, the Zionist uh, ally, in this day where the determinations will be manifest, and Iraq, under the leadership of the great leader Saddam Hussein, may God protect him. This will be a protection, a shield for this nation, for humanity against those evils, those tyrants in America and Britain. Dear citizens, the President Saddam Hussein, may God protect him, will speak to you. as we're listening there to the Iraqi national anthem. We have been hearing for quite some time now that the Iraqi president, Saddam Hussein, is expected to address the nation shortly once again. You heard a few moments ago the Iraqi information minister, Mohammed Saeed Sahab, saying indeed that the Iraqi president is about to begin. And uh, there he is. Let's listen in. Most merciful, most compassionate. Those who are fought as they are treated unjustly, we are granted permission to fight and God will give them victory.
All right, we seem to have lost our feed to Baghdad uh, literally just a few moments after the Iraqi President Saddam Hussein began his address to the nation. Of course, we are working to get that link back up for you. I believe it is back, so we'll continue listening. <laughs> هو أعوانه جريمته التي كان يتوعد بها العراق والإنسانية يردف فعله الإجرامي من يردف فعله الإجرامي معه and his and the act of those who helped him and his followers this is added to the series of their shameful crimes against Iraq and the humanity this is a start for other additional crimes all Iraqis and those who care in our nation sacrificing for you and for the values of our nation and the banners of fighting and for its religion and for the soul the family the son and here i will not repeat what should be said oh, it is a duty on all people good people you that repeat what has to be done to protect and defend this dear nation and the values and sacred but i will say for to each this is a must on all of us but i say on any of us on each of us in the family of iraq the believing the honest family that is being treated unjustly by its enemies on all of us on each of us we have to remember what was said and what was pledged and these days will go as god wills this will add these days will add to your record your bright record Oh, you male and female dignified people this is your share of dignity and victory and everything that will raise the status before God and will let infidels down the enemies of humanity and God and that you will be victorious O oh Iraqis and with you are Victorious will be with you are the people of your, the sons of your nation and you are victorious with the will of God and your enemies will be in humiliation and defeat God willing Go you sword I'm not draw your sword and I'm not afraid draw your sword the enemy is making a fuss and the enemy will not be stopped except by let the reins be let go anyway but hope is there let thunderstorms go until the guidance appears and injustice goes away and let dawn be the way to confront to confront all bad and pull your trigger and keep the fire on with draw your draw your sword no one will be victorious unless you uh, unless he is a man and a brave man and prepare a banner and call for the way of God that the wounds will heal quickly Dear friends, those who call for evil in the world, 
Oh, those who, uh, who fight evil in the world, peace be upon you. You notice how Bush, the careless, underestimated your values that you declared against the war and your call, your honest call for peace. And he committed this shameful crime this day. We pledge in our name and in the name of the command and leadership and the name of the people, the fighting people and its heroic army in, this, in, uh, in its history and record of civilization, we pledge that we will confront the invaders and we will get them to, God willing, to the limit where they will lose their patience and they will lose any hope in accomplishing what, what they were driven to by the Zionists, the criminal Zionists, and those who have agendas. They will go to, to the lowest levels and they will be defeated, a defeat that we hope for them after they went far in injustice and evil. We love peace and we are working towards this. Peace. Iraq will be victorious, will win. And with Iraq, our nation and humanity will win. And evil will suffer from what makes it incapable of doing any evil or crime at a level similar to the American Zionist alliance against nations and at the forefront is our dignified nation, Arab nation. God is great, God is great. At the beginning, uh, at the forefront is our, our nation. God is great, God is great. And live long Iraq and Palestine. God is great, God is great. And our Arab nation, dignified nation, let, let that nation live and the hum, human brotherhood, let it live with those who love peace and security and the right of people in freedom uh, according to justice and equality. God is great and let the losers lose. Let Iraq live. La long live jihad and long live Palestine. Iraqi President Saddam Hussein in a speech to his countrymen, what must they think? Uh, Saddam Hussein in military garb tonight. Uh, normally we see him in civilian clothes, but the last couple of times we've seen him, he has been in his military uniform. He was, um, he referred to President Bush as Little Bush. I actually heard it as Junior Bush, but uh, in any case, he wasn't paying the President of the United States a compliment and described this as a crime against Iraq and a crime against humanity. It is the duty of all good people to protect our dear nation. He said, I am not afraid. And then, and this is important, um, three different times as I heard it, he referred to Zionists, the American Zionist Alliance. He said, long live Palestine. It is certainly the Iraqi president's hope that the Arab world will see this in the context of the long and difficult dispute between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Uh, that 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 uh, in Arab capitals, that, citizen, that, that Islamic citizens will rise up in some way, shape, or form, uh, and that that will protect or, or deflect uh, some of what is about to come uh, visited upon Iraq. And so we heard it at least three times, um, this notion that this is a, an American Zionist, read that, Israeli alliance. The question, I suppose, Nick Robertson, or one question, Nick, is whether in fact that was Saddam Hussein. He is a man uh, we know with a number of uh, lookalikes or doubles. Um, do we know with absolute certainty that we were listening to the Iraqi president? It would certainly seem at this time that uh, every intention was given to convey that this was the real President Saddam Hussein. He is known to have a number of doubles. 
and perhaps analyzing that carefully would be difficult because of the large glasses, the beret, and uh, the highly the, the the fact that his collar was pulled up quite highly. It would take a very sophisticated set of analysis, I think, of pictures of him to make a determination. It sounded very much like him. The rhetoric was extremely strong. He looked much more serious than we have seen him look recently. He portrays himself on Iraqi television as looking very relaxed. Very interesting there, Aaron, of course, the theme that, uh, that, all, that all of this is driven by Zionism, is driven by the United States' aggression to gain control over the region. We hear that time and time again from Iraqi officials. Very interesting here to get a hint, the first hint perhaps, of how Iraq thinks it will deal with this uh, war saying that, uh, that uh, we will drive them to the limit, drive the invading forces to the limit where they lose their patience and they will lose their hope and the day will come where they are driven down to their lowest level and give up. This is the first time we've heard an Iraqi official articulate how they plan to try and win. They plan to try and do it here by making sure that the United States loses its patience, that the troops lose their hope that uh, their morale is driven to its lowest level. This is something that we haven't heard before. Very interesting, a call to arms, a call to arms to draw your swords, to draw your guns. Uh, clearly calling on the Iraqi people at this very, very critical time uh, for them to stand with the government, to stand behind the leadership. Of course, difficult to uh, analyze as well exactly what, really, what people really are feeling in their hearts of hearts as they stand, as they know, on the brink of a very, very serious war at this time, Aaron. It is, uh, I, uh, to use a colloquialism, it is the knock on the Americans, I suppose, that, um, and this is a product of Vietnam, that the country does not have the staying power uh, in moments like this, that it does not have the will to take casualties, that it does not have the will to expend um, the human res the lives, I almost said human resources, does not have the willingness to accept the casualties of war. Um, that has been the knock on, on the country in the post-Vietnam era. Uh, we, would, we would just refer again to something that President Bush said uh, when he talked. He made it very clear that this may go on a long time but I think the term was no half measures here, no half victories here, that in the president's view, the president of the United States' view, the United States is in it to the end. And there, in my, in, in our view, there could be little question that that is indeed the American feeling tonight, that, that they will do what it takes as quickly as possible, but they will do what it takes to do the job the president has enunciated over uh, now many, 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 many months. Wolf, this question of whether it was Saddam and the doubles, uh, I, I don't mean to use the term paranoid in the classic um, psychiatric sense, we'll use it in the idiomatic sense, he is a man obsessed with security. He certainly is a man obsessed with security. And let me make a couple points about what we've just seen unfold on Iraqi television before coming out here to Kuwait. Over the past several months, I've had several high-level briefings with U.S. and other intelligence sources, and they point out about the whole issue of Saddam Hussein having body doubles. Usually that's when he's out in public. They have someone who looks like him, uh, dresses like him, can walk in, the, in a crowd and almost pretend to be him, but you never hear that other person speak. Saddam Hussein has a very distinctive voice in Arabic, and anyone uh, who's an Arabic speaker could certainly make out if, in fact, that was or was not Saddam Hussein, given the very recognized voice that he has. In this particular case, he spoke. You saw him reading from his notes uh, so clearly. Uh, anyone who knows Saddam Hussein's voice would be well aware of that this was in fact Saddam Hussein. The other point you have to notice, at the top of his speech he referred to the date now in this part of the world, 20 March 2003. That indicates that this was not a previously recorded videotape. This was a tape recording that was done uh, since the U.S. Uh, strike began, those cruise missiles, F-117As, launched the, that attack on those selected targets in Baghdad. The, uh, the, the, the Iraqi leader also was very, very precise in terms of going after 
the President of the United States, at one point he called him the criminal Junior Bush. The criminal Junior Bush, a very derogatory term as far as the Arab world is concerned, meaning that he's just a junior as far as his father was concerned. And there's this long-standing, of course, animosity, hatred between the Bush family, of course, and the Saddam Hussein family, if you will. So it was getting very personal there as well. Let's bring Christian Amanpour. As you assess this situation, Christian, you see Saddam Hussein emerging on Iraqi television literally only very briefly after the U.S. clearly sought to decapitate the Iraqi leadership. It reminded me of what happened earlier in the day when there were rum rumors that Tariq Aziz, the deputy prime minister of Iraq, had, uh, had fled or had been killed, and he emerged on television right away. It underscores how sophisticated the Iraqi regime is. Well, yeah, and Nick Robinson was talking about that as well. I mean, it underscores that they understand the, uh, the, the capacity of the airwaves, and they need to show what they want to show quite quickly. But I think in terms of what he said about Americans losing patience and perhaps underestimating America's uh, staying power, I think what many people in the world forget is that that equation changed in the United States after September 11th. That's the one major change, I think, in terms of the American people's willingness to take casualties and the politicians' willingness to commit forces. Because now, after so many Americans were killed on September 11th, and so many police and firefighters were killed doing their job, there is no question any longer that the soldiers who are paid to do the job of fighting and sometimes dying will have to do it as well. So I think it's no longer appropriate for people around the world to uh, question whether the United States forces and the United States public will have weak stomachs for this kind of, uh, of battle. Certainly, we don't know what's going to happen in the long run, but for the moment, I think that the public opinion in the United States shows that this is not in question and that the American people will support their troops uh, as long as they get the job done. In terms of his constant repeating and referring to the uh, American Zionist plan, this is one of the main reasons why there has been so uh, essentially little support in the Arab world for a war in Iraq. The fact that the United States has allowed and not intervened in the Arab-Israeli crisis over the last couple of years, and that this is going on unabated, certainly does not provide the ideal context in this part of the world for an attack on Iraq. And certainly speaking to many Arab leaders over the last few weeks and months, many of them said that had there been an attempt to uh, put out the flames between the Palestinians and the Israelis, many of the Arab leaders would have been much more uh, forthright and overt about their support for uh, the disarmament of Saddam Hussein. So I think uh, that's something that he knows goes down well in this region. Aaron? Christian, thanks. I think um, many in the Arab world would in fact say that uh, this President Bush, President George W. Bush, has been less even-handed. Uh, they would say that. We're not saying that. They would say that then was President Clinton in his dealing with the Israeli dispute, and that has certainly, as Christian indicated, um, caused Arab leaders and people in Arab capitals and believers in the Palestinian cause great concern. Nick Robertson in Baghdad. Um, what is... Indeed, Aaron, I mean, Go ahead. Go ahead. No, Aaron, I think uh, very much what, about what Christian was saying there. This may be the miscalculation by President Saddam Hussein. It's often been, uh, it's often been suggested that he made a miscalculation in understanding uh, United States intentions and world intentions when he invaded Kuwait back in 1990. This may be the flaw in his, in his decision-making process at this time rather than going for further cooperation with the UN weapons inspectors, deciding to perhaps to go to war with the aim of uh, undermining U United States resolve, undermining uh, uh, public support for an action against Iraq by believing that that can be done through attrition of forces. Uh, perhaps this may yet prove to be the major miscalculation of, of President Saddam Hussein. This seems to be, from his speech, however, and in, that is, his first indication, perhaps, that this is, is his intention to approach the war from this point of view, not one that he could win outright militarily, but one that he can perhaps win by slowing forces and creating casualties on the way to Baghdad. 
Uh, I think that's a great point. And just to underscore one other point, uh, actually, that Wolf made earlier that ought not get lost in here, that uh, Saddam, and we assume it was Saddam, at least we have no reason to believe it was not, uh, dated the speech. He said on uh, this 20th of March. And, uh, and so if the American attempt was to get him, I think we can, and, and if that was him, okay, there's many qualifiers that we can handle in one sentence, uh, pretty clearly that part failed. The other point I would make on that is it's hard to know um, if he actually believes uh, in the American impatience, General Clark, if he actually believes that that's um, real still in this post-Vietnam, we're a long way from Vietnam, um, if he believes that, or whether or not that's just the kind of thing you say for public consumption, the audience here is complicated. It's an Iraqi audience, it's an international audience, it's an Arab audience. There are many different constituencies listening to this that he was speaking to. General uh, that's, Clark. Exact, uh, that's exactly right, Aaron. He is speaking. And, and he's speaking as much to the international audience, I believe, as to his own people on this. And so he's projecting what he hopes to be the case. He's trying to project his own moral superiority. I think it's very interesting that he felt like after this strike he had to come out and show himself, uh, which, you know, on the one hand, you say, okay, we missed. On the other hand, it's, it is a sign of some degree of insecurity that, uh, you know, he's aware enough that, and it feels vulnerable enough that, hey, it's a real possibility they could have got me, so I'm going to show myself. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think that uh, that in, a, in itself is a measure of some degree of success in the U.S. strategy at this point. I mean, on the larger field, we really don't have a good picture here, Aaron. As I was watching all of this tonight unfold, I recall sitting in Belgium during the Kosovo campaign, and in my headquarters, we always had CNN or, or, or another network on because we wanted to see what the public was learning and we wanted to see the pictures of in some cases sure. our own efforts and uh, it was always surprising when i get the battle damage readouts through the official channels how much there was that wasn't captured on the television well it's only if, understandable but the, yeah. the medium is so powerful that it dominates uh, i think that's a great point and the fact is uh, we have yet to see um, anything that says damage. We don't know what was hit and what wasn't hit. We haven't seen it yet. We may see it later today. We may not see it later today. There's a lot of things about this day that's unfolding. We don't know. Um, does it gall you as a retired general uh, when this notion that Americans and the American military does not have the staying power, uh, does that gall you or do you just kind of laugh it off as a piece of history that is purely irrelevant? Well, it, it's, it's, really, um, it's, it's really unfortunate if that, in fact, is what he believes, because I, th I, I do believe this country has enormous staying power, and the quality of the American Armed Forces is absolutely superb, and not only the quality in the sense of technology, but the training, the character of the troops and the leadership. They've got staying power like probably no army in history has ever had. So. Uh, if it's unfortunate if people believe that and it leads them to miscalculate and seek war with the United States. I mean, the rational course for Saddam would have been to cooperate with the yeah. UN a long time ago. Not to be glib about it, but here's a guy who was badly trounced a dozen years ago. I mean, it wasn't like this. This is not like this is his first experience in this matter. He's actually done this dance before with the United States, and he actually knows how this plays out. And to miscalculate, I asked this question of former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger once. What must he be thinking to see these 300,000 troops on his border, to know that there are literally thousands of missiles and uh, hundreds and hundreds of jet planes prepared to launch, uh, launch other missiles, drop other bombs? What possible military mind is making these decisions? It's hard to understand from the outside, but on the other hand, when we watched Milosevic go through this, we had every reason to believe that he was being lied to by his generals. And certainly we know that Saddam Hussein is a man who doesn't like bad news. And so it's very possible that his generals are saying to him, A, we don't believe the United States has those forces, not all of them there. We looked, we didn't General, see them, I, I'm so a, forth. Um, I, I promise I won't do this too often. Gary Stryker is one of our embeds. Hard to get these guys on the air. He's out at sea. Um, report to us what you can. 
Um, well, Aaron, uh, we're out on the um, USS Theodore Roosevelt in the Eastern Mediterranean. And uh, you may hear above me, we're in a room just below the flight deck. Uh, Tomcats and Hornets are taking off. But this is business as usual on this aircraft this time of day. Uh, they're practicing uh, launches and recoveries, and there's no indication that any of the uh, fighter aircraft on, on this carrier are participating in uh, any action that may be taking place over Iraq right now. Uh, the, the Pentagon, as, as you've uh, indicated, uh, released some video from the uh, Donald Cook, a destroyer, uh, which actually uh, is in the Red Sea, but came from well, one of the battle groups here in the Mediterranean. Uh, last week, they slipped through the Suez Canal to get to the Red Sea, where they would be in a position to uh, launch cruise uh, missiles, tomahawks, uh, uh, from, from there. And there was some question about whether they uh, could maintain their position in, in the eastern Mediterranean uh, as effectively as they could in the Red Sea. So they slipped through the Suez Canal last week with some degree of secrecy. It was a very um, uh, tedious process of getting through the canal because of uh, obvious security concerns, possible terrorist attacks when they're exposed to danger. Um, but at, at this point now, um, Aaron, there's, there's nothing happening on the, on the Roosevelt, or as we understand, on the, on the Truman uh -huh. uh, in, the, in the eastern Mediterranean that uh, bears on this conflict right now in the, uh, over Iraq. Gary, but they are aware, are they not, what has already happened today? or last night our Oh, yes, time. they are. Okay. And how did they find out, do you know? Uh, the, the men on the ship? Yeah, and women. The men on the ship are, are watching um, CNN. Uh, the men on the ship are watching television. They've got, uh, they're plugged into, uh, hmm. uh, into the Internet uh, as well. But uh, they have televisions throughout this vessel, and uh, most of them are to, uh, to CNN. 24-hour basis at this well I, I threw you a hanging curve and i appreciate very much you're hitting it out of the park gary thank you gary striker out at sea nick robertson in uh baghdad nick it is still playing out there the siren's still going off is that right indeed this seems to be the all clear siren going off again aaron uh, okay. no signs of uh, anti-aircraft gunfire at this time it, it does appear to be the all clear at this moment okay uh, hang on, Nick. Let me go back to General Clark for a second, if I can. Uh, General, what are what is Tommy Franks doing? General Franks doing? What are the planners doing right now? They have started something. What would you guess they are doing now? Well, it, it's daylight, so first of all, they're all awake and working on this issue. And secondly, they may be trying to uh, continue to adjust the timetable. There may be other targets of opportunity that they're after. They may have decided since they've sprung it now, now they've got to have extra patrols airborne to take advantage of what's happening next. Or they may simply have told people, move it up. They're also going to be concerned about how to synchronize the air and the ground. It's possible the ground forces could sit there for a while, but normally, doctrinally, in an attack position, you'd like to pause there for as little time as possible and so there's probably phone calls going through back and forth trying to figure out okay now they know we're coming and uh, so how much tactical surprise is left and how do we play one side off against the other and what does this unit do and that unit do now and if not now then when so I think there's a lot of high-level conversations going on right now and I think the troops down uh, down at the bottom are cleaning their weapons and looking at their maps again and making routine uh, pre-battle checks. Do you have any sense that those troops, those particularly, the, you know, we, we've had this concern over the last couple of days. We, the United States government, has had this concern over the last couple of days that Saddam might... All right, now uh, we'd like to break away from CNN USA and take you live to Baghdad. The Information Minister, uh, Mohammed Saeed al Sahafa is addressing reporters. Let's listen in to his remarks. Prime Minister of Britain, they've embarked on an act of stupidity that we've warned them not to commit. They started their aggression against our country. Their attacks coincided with the dawn prayer at the time when the minarets of Baghdad were calling to prayer, saying God is great. 
those cowards and tyrants and criminals started dropping their bombs and missiles on our country and our people in defiance of international law and the international community against the United Nations and as I said before, we can't understand how to deal with these people. They are war criminals, they are mercenaries. Uh, the international law that applies to armed struggle does not apply to them. This is uh, naked aggression and piracy, and this is what pirates and mercenaries do. This is what war criminals do. Therefore, international law does not apply to them. They are criminals. This naked aggression will be met by Iraqi resistance, and the Ira people of Iraq will defeat this aggression. I ask you to show the world the crimes of the Americans and the Zionists and the British. We will take you everywhere so you can show the world. Feel free to show them these crimes. Now I introduce to you uh, the Minister of Culture, Hamid Yusuf Hamadi. Today, the American administration has declared its bankruptcy. Today, that bankruptcy has become official before the entire world. And I, I'm not talking about the uh, media side my colleague here has told you, but I would like to tell the world that the pretext that was used by the American administration that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, and that was changed to what's called regime change. I would like you to go back to the 9th of December 1988 9th of September 1988 and that day Senator Bell. the uh, information and culture ministers of Iraq uh, talking to reporters um, I'm not sure what the question was that launched that rhetorical attack, or even if there was one, uh, but that is part of the moment and part of what goes on in these moments in an attempt to play to these multiple constituencies that General Clark uh, was talking about a little bit ago. I was a lowly seaman in the Coast Guard. I've, I've interrupted a general twice tonight. I will pay for that at some point. Christiane? Well, Aaron, clearly a concerted effort by the top leadership in Baghdad to come out. All right, we're going to leave coverage of CNN USA and take you back to the news conference in Baghdad. Well, Speaking now is the Iraqi culture minister, Hamad Yusuf Hamadi. Let's you. listen into that. The first sanction was to <clears throat> ban Iraq from importing bread and American wheat. In April 1990, before the crisis in Kuwait, the United States was boycotting Iraq and the scientific field and uh, also at that time the chief of staff of the Zionist army 
uh, threatened Iraq to destroy a number of locations in Iraq. Therefore, the conspiracy against Iraq is not a new one. It's been there for years. Iraq and the Arab nation have to confront these evil plots, but Iraq will prevail under the leadership of President Saddam Hussein, will be victorious. Saddam is not only the leader of Iraq, he is the hero of humanity. There will be statements. We will inform you through a military communique very soon. We will, we will inform you. We will inform you. The sooner. Yeah. Well, I'm sure they are stupid and they will never succeed. But at the same time, this is a good testimony. This is a good proof that they are criminals and they are killers and that they are believing in assassinations. So I think they should be condemned. They are stupid and condemned. Uh, not only yeah. that, but uh, the, president, the president is now on TV delivering yeah. a speech. We have the, His Excellency had delivered, this, delivered a speech. <laughs> this is hypothetical. This is aggression. And we will destroy this aggression. Iraq is one front against the invaders and they will get what they deserve. Iraq is defending itself and whoever wants to defend Iraq then will be welcome to join us. It's not only that. It, will, it will be a very difficult war and it will end in them being defeated. We will give you all the information you need and you'll be free to go anywhere you like to, to see and visit and we'll help you to get there. All right, we've been listening there to remarks by Iraq's cultural minister, Mohammed Yusuf Hamdi, as well as the Iraqi information minister, Mohammed Saif al-Sahab. Um, both gentlemen are saying that the United States has embarked on an act of stupidity, um, that we warned them not to commit, that they are cowards, tyrants and criminals acting in defiance of international law and the international community, saying that indeed they will get what they deserve and it will be a difficult war and will end in them being defeated now if you are just joining us we just like to bring you up to date on the developments over the last few hours the military campaign that the United States is calling operation Iraqi freedom has begun US cruise missiles and stealth fighters took to the skies over Iraq some uh, three hours ago roughly about 90 minutes after Washington's ultimatum to Baghdad expired. Now suddenly air raid sirens were heard in the Iraqi capital along with the explosions. Iraqi anti-aircraft tracers were seen in the skies above the city. The first official word of what was underway came from White House Press Secretary Ari Fleischer. The opening stages of the disarmament of the Iraqi regime have begun. The president will address the nation at 10.15. About half an hour later, President George W. Bush addressed his nation and confirmed that American and British forces were in the early stages of their attack on Iraq. At this hour, 
American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. On my orders, coalition forces have begun striking selected targets of military importance to undermine Saddam Hussein's ability to wage war. These are opening stages of what will be a broad and concerted campaign. CNN is told that one of the first U.S.-led attacks was a decapitation strike aimed at killing Iraqi President Saddam Hussein. Mr. Hussein did appear on Iraqi television a short while ago condemning what he called shameful crimes by the United States, emphasizing and also wanting to make a point to the U.S. by giving the date of his address to ensure uh, and to send a message that indeed he had not been struck in that attack. Now, some specifics uh, now on what military assets we know have been used up to this point. Now, Pentagon sources say more than 40 cruise missiles were fired from three naval vessels, a destroyer and a submarine in the Red Sea, and a third war warship in the Persian Gulf. Now, F-117 Nighthawk stealth fighters were also used in that attack. While their technology dates back to the 1960s, the fighters have updated avionics and also carry what are known as bunker buster laser guided bombs. Now we're going to get an update on developments from Rim Brahimi. She joins us now from Baghdad for the latest on that. She joins us on the phone. Rim. Indeed to me uh, about uh, uh, four hours uh, almost maybe a little less than four hours <clears throat> after uh, we heard the first air raid siren here at dawn. Well the president uh, President Saddam Hussein uh, was shown on Iraqi TV. Uh, his speech, uh, roughly, his speech came uh, roughly about a half hour ago, and specifying, as you mentioned to me, that this on this day, the 20th of March, 2003, uh, President Bush perpetrated the crime he had threatened to commit, calling President Bush a criminal, condemning the U.S. for the same, the shameful crime. Uh, he said the U.S. was committing in defiance of international law. The president also said that uh, President Bush had underestimated the Iraqis, that the Iraqis would fight the invaders, they would fight what he called the U.S. Zionist invasion. He called on Iraqis to pull their trigger and to draw their swords, saying Iraqis were brave and they would be victorious. Now, uh, the speech of the president uh, was aired on uh, Iraqi TV uh, that seems to also have uh, been aired on the same signal as Shabab TV, which is the t television that's run here by the president's eldest son, Uday Saddam Hussein. It was also uh, broadcast on uh, Iraqi radio. And then shortly after that, uh, the Minister of Information, Mohammed Saeed al Sahaf, uh, came, uh, uh, presented, talked to reporters from the Ministry of Information, a uh, press conference in which he called Americans war criminals, saying the U.S. Uh, forces were mercenaries and that this was a naked aggression. He called it piracy. He said this naked, naked uh, aggression would be met by fierce resistance. To me? Now, Reem, we have been hearing uh, from a short while ago from Nick Robertson, who is also in Baghdad, that the all-clear sirens had been sounded by Iraqi officials. Can you update us on exactly what's going on, um, at least and also from what you've been able to see, what's going on on the streets of Baghdad at this point? Yes, to me. Uh, first, just let me mention that uh, President Saddam Hussein's speech is being broadcast again on Iraqi TV as we're speaking now. Uh, now, indeed, the all-clear siren uh, came up about 45 minutes ago, uh, a little less maybe, but basically since the, uh, air raid si the first air raid, air raid siren began, uh, we've had an all-clear once and then another uh, air raid warning and then an all-clear again a short while ago. Gradually, as day daylight has been uh, coming up, we've also seen a few cars emerging, not a lot of traffic in the streets of Baghdad, just a few cars uh, driving along uh, the view we have here is the road known as Abu Nawaz Street along the river and a lot of uh, just very few cars here uh, coming out right now not many people in the streets at all maybe one person every 15 minutes you can spot very very vaguely but it's very calm very quiet 
um, not much traffic, not much noise at all to me. All right, Rena, I'm going to ask you just to stay with us for a minute. We're going to uh, uh, give you a little bit more of a sense of what exactly it was that President Saddam Hussein said in his address to the nation just a short while ago. Let's hear that. Free people in all over the world. Peace be upon you all. In this day, which will be memorialized in the history of nation and humanity as the day of great jihad to protect nations and to protect freedom and to protect sovereignty and to protect independence and to protect dignity and to protect our people the victorious the champion the champions of Iraq and the future of our Arab nation against the tyrant of this era, the Zionist uh, ally, in this day where the determinations will be manifest and Iraq under the leadership of the great leader Saddam Hussein, may God protect him. This will be a protection, a shield for this nation, for humanity against those evils, those tyrants in America and Britain. All right, we were just listening there to the introduction to uh, President Saddam Hussein's speech given there by Mohammed Saeed al sahab He was the Iraqi, uh, he is the Iraqi Information Minister. We are working on getting those uh, remarks of President Saddam Hussein up for you. Just as soon as we have them ready, we'll, we'll get them to you. But right now, we'd like to go back to Rim Brahimi. She is uh, in Baghdad. Now, Rim, a few moments ago, you were telling us exactly uh, what sense uh, you were getting from the streets that gradually, it seems, people are coming out. But but of course, one thing that we've seen over the past few days is their efforts at preparation uh, leading up to this action. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, exactly what was happening in, in the past two days or so? Absolutely, to me. The past two days uh, were very uh, sort of interesting pace, uh, interesting atmosphere in and around Baghdad, basically in the streets. Uh, Baghdad is a city like many mis Middle Eastern cities where in, in the evening uh, the street just livens up, shop windows are usually uh, bright with lights and uh, people just go around their business, it's shopping time for everybody, um, it's usually where, time where people like to go and sit at a cafe or go, and, uh, go to the restaurant, well past 48 hours it was very eerie, a sort of eerie calm and quiet on the streets of Baghdad. Uh, shopkeepers had closed their windows. Some of them had emptied their shop windows from, from all their contents. Some shopkeepers, to me, had even built brick, uh, brick walls in front of their shops uh, to uh, protect them. Um, it was very, very uh, strange indeed. Uh, the children had stopped going to school for the past two days. I understand also university students uh, hadn't uh, attended university. All right, all right, Rick, it I'm, was a very strange I'm going to have to just stop you there for just a moment. We're going to rejoin uh, CNN USA for an update on the situation in Baghdad. Day ahead, Christian. Aaron, just a quick correction from my part. When I was describing the two ministers who were talking, I said one of them was the president of the Iraqi National Assembly. In fact, the second minister there was the culture minister. We're going to go now to CNN's Becky Diamond, who is in one on one of those warships in the Persian Gulf, which launched some of those cruise missiles earlier this morning, our time, evening, your time. Becky? I definitely like the water and the... Becky, can you hear me there? Well, this morning, yes, I'm on the USS Milius. We're in the northern Persian Gulf at about 5.02 local time. That's 9.02 Eastern time. The ship launched eight Tomahawk missiles. Now, one didn't quite make it, and its booster fell not too far from me in the Persian Gulf, but seven made it, and it was quite a sight. We're on the flight deck, and the mood was somber, but there was a sense of relief here on the ship that, that, we, that the ship has gotten started. Back to you.
Becky, thank you very much indeed. A little hard to hear everything, but clearly Becky was saying that uh, some of those Tomahawk cruise missiles had been launched from uh, where she was in the Persian Gulf. We're going to go back to Aaron. Thank you. I, that's the first time um, that I think we've seen that particular uh, set of pictures. Um, and they are, you see these missiles being fired, and they are, they, it is chilling to see. They are, I mean, we all know the power of them, and we all understand the significance of what we are watching. Uh, but each time you see it, or at least time we see it, um, we find it chilling and striking. Uh, it is the sign that this war uh, is on, even as it started in a way we, none of us, honestly, we don't kid you about this, we, none of us anticipated it would start in quite the way it has started tonight. Uh, we expected it to start, and in, in many ways we're assured it would start in a huge manner. But obviously something happened. Somebody saw something. A satellite caught a glimpse of something human intelligence on the ground became aware of something and there was a reason then to start in this limited way if you will uh, the opening that the president described uh, some hours ago now uh, chris burns is uh, covers the White House as part of the team of CNN correspondents that covers the White House and he's taken the duty across the street from the White House uh, chris did you get any sense uh, in your reporting today, obviously it's been very tense at the White House for the last couple of days, any sense that today or tonight was the night? Well, it's interesting you say that nobody expected this uh, to happen quite this way, and perhaps even President Bush didn't expect it to happen this way. He was in the middle of a second war planning session. This had been happening since the beginning of the week, an afternoon session. And in the middle of that session, he got some information from the CIA and other agencies telling him there was, in the words of uh, senior administration officials, a major leadership target. Exactly who that is, they're not saying. Exactly where it was, they're not saying. But this uh, given to him as a, an opportunity that should not be missed. And that is why the president decided in the middle of that meeting to go ahead and give the go-ahead to launch more than 40 cruise missiles against that major leadership target. Uh, the president... Uh, uh, also, in his speech, uh, interesting that he addressed uh, the aspect of human shields and civilian casualties attacking early uh, the uh, regime uh, in Baghdad, saying that they will uh, be using civilians as human shields. They will be sending their forces, their military, into civilian areas uh, in as, uh, to defend themselves and to uh, attack uh, U.S.-led forces uh, going in. Uh, here's what President Bush had to say. In this conflict... America faces an enemy who has no regard for conventions of war or rules of morality. Saddam Hussein has placed Iraqi troops and equipment in civilian areas, attempting to use innocent men, women, and children as shields for his own military, a final atrocity against his people. And the president also justifying, aiming to justify the uh, offensive that has been launched, saying that uh, armies of firefighters and policemen could uh, be involved in addressing uh, terrorist attacks. That is why the United States has to act now. Aaron. Chris, thank you. Um, as, we have, as we have talked, and we have talked certainly for the last couple of weeks a good deal about how uh, milit military planners sourcing at the Pentagon have uh, described to us how we expected to see this war begin. On the Iraqi side, there's a lot of speculation about how the Iraqis would fight the war. There's also been speculation, of course, whether the Iraqis would fight the war, whether they would lay down their guns, whether they would surrender quickly uh, at this shock and awe strategy. But the, the tactic that concerns planners the most is that they would, the Iraqis would bring all of their forces or their best forces, the Special Republican Guard and the Republican Guard, that they would bring them into Baghdad or around Baghdad and they would make their stand in Baghdad. Baghdad's about 350 miles from the Kuwaiti border. That's a long supply line for the Americans to maintain. It's not an easy thing to do. And then you get to Baghdad itself and you go through the worst and most difficult kind of combat, house-to-house -house urban combat. 
that. And in that situation, all these sophisticated bombs, all these uh, satellites and this and that don't help you. It's man on man, literally. And that is where the casualties can occur and undoubtedly would occur if it would come to that. And in fact, there are calculations about how many casualties I've never, I've never quite understood how they figure these sorts of things out, but there are calculations about the kind of losses that forces would take if it comes down to that sort of urban fighting. Nick Robertson, um, I can't imagine sitting where you are this morning knowing that it is very possible and indeed in some respects likely that this thing will end in the battle, a street battle in Baghdad. Indeed, and, and what many people tell us here, and this is clearly something that the government appeals to, trying, even if it cannot appeal to people to support it because it is the government and President Saddam Hussein is the leader, to fight because the country is being invaded. That very simple notion that Iraq is a nation and that the people of this nation should defend themselves from attackers regardless of who is the head of the nation. That is something we've been hearing in speeches. And it is something we hear from people when we talk to them privately away from cameras where they will say, perhaps we don't want this leader, perhaps we could have another leader, but our country is being invaded. It is our duty to defend the country. People here we've talked to talk about defending their homes and their houses. The pictures we see on television in the evening has been of urban training for urban warfare. It is difficult to know, however, how much of a heart people will put into that fight, what exactly uh, forces, uh, coalition forces will find in terms of resistance when they arrive in Baghdad. We do not see, and we are not shown here, large dispositions of forces in and around Baghdad. Certainly they are there, certainly there are many military barracks, certainly there are other locations that the uh, military does use to live in inside this city. When I was south of Baghdad a few days ago, it was clear that some defensive installations are being made along the road to Baghdad. Indeed, some areas appear to, appear to be being prepared for battles ahead. Aaron? Nick, it is, uh, I suppose, how the Iraqis respond, how the Iraqi military responds, how the citizens, the five million or so citizens of Baghdad respond if this becomes a fight for Baghdad, uh, depends a, a fair amount on what precedes the fight for Baghdad, how much uh, damage is inflicted, how much uh, intimidation is carried out by the American forces when they ultimately do launch the large-scale attack, which is still to come. Um, it, Nick, I haven't said this, and I probably won't say it again, but we all think it. Stay safe out there, okay? Nick Robertson, who's in Baghdad, and uh, we don't, in truth, we don't make a big deal about uh, reporters in these sorts of situations because it's something they choose to do. It's what we do, and we choose to do it, but we worry about them uh, on nights like this a lot. Uh, Wolf, you have uh, had some time to think about and talk to people a bit about this, this the Saddam TV address and whether we need to put Saddam in quotes or not, whether there was Saddam or not. I thought it interesting, though, the point that someone made a bit ago that it is difficult. It, it's one thing to look like somebody. It's another thing to really sound like somebody. And there's no doubt that Saddam Hussein has a very precise voice, very recognizable in Arabic. So there's little doubt. I, I think there's virtually no doubt whether or not that was, in fact, Saddam Hussein. Here's where the doubt is. He did say March uh, 20th, 2003 in this part of the world. It is now March 20th, 2003, when those Tomahawk cruise missiles landed in Baghdad. It was already March 20th, 2003. The question, I think, that's a fair question that deserves to be answered is whether or not this videotape of Saddam Hussein speaking out against what he called the criminal Junior Bush was taped after the cruise missiles landed or before the cruise missiles landed. A significant question that we don't have the answer to, but it's certainly one that will uh, that intelligence officials around the world will be pondering to see if that U.S. strike, the, the, the decapitation strike, as they call it, going after presumably Saddam Hussein, Hussein personally, was successful or unsuccessful. Based on the videotape alone, Aaron, I don't think we can reach that conclusion because that tape could have been prepared before the strike with the date in it, only to be released after those first uh, cruise missiles 
hit Baghdad. So th there's still a little bit of a question when that tape was made. And I, and I don't think either of us want to put too fine a point on this, but was there, because I think the chances are it is Saddam Hussein, um, but was there, as you think through the speech, other than the date, do you recall him saying anything in that speech that suggested what the attack was, that they had tried to get the leadership then failed tonight? Anything specific enough to say it had to be tonight? There was no other specific reference, a date reference, or a specific reference to what exactly happened that would indicate that. That's why I, I, I'm suggesting the possibility, we don't know this for sure, the possibility that that was a pre-recorded videotape to be released after the first bombs fell in Baghdad in order to reassure the Iraqi population, the Arab world, if you will, that Saddam Hussein is in fact alive. I don't think we can reach that conclusion on that tape per se because there was no other specific reference to precisely what happened other than the date March 20th that was released. I don't think there's any doubt it was Saddam Hussein, yeah. but we don't know when that tape was made. Just be before you throw it uh, anywhere, just one other thing about the speech that I, I thought about as I watched it and now looking at the tape again, um, and this may or may, it may or may not mean a single thing, it is, he's reading off what almost looks to me like a steno pad, a notepad, and it all does look, okay, it, it may not be, but it all does look very quickly put together. Uh, and again, that may or may not mean anything. It's just one of those things we noted while we were watching it. Uh, it did not have the look of a very sophisticated, prepared speech, uh, which might have been recorded some other time to be played after the first bombs hit. Just a thought, Wolf. You're, abs you're, a you're absolutely right, Aaron, and there's no doubt that he was reading from various notebooks. If you, if you took a careful look, he would uh, bring up various pieces of paper as if the speech had been written in uh, different, different parts. Christiana Amanpour is here with me in Kuwait, and she's been reflecting on what we've seen over the past few hours as well. Yes, well, I leave it up to you to, basically, we've said all we can, I think, about this, and you're absolutely right, there were various notebooks, it looked like it was handwritten, he kept flipping his pages. Um, of course, we're not just talking about all the U.S. and U.K. forces arrayed against Saddam Hussein here in Kuwait, but over there in the northern uh, Iraqi area, where the U.S. had hoped to open a second front up there, uh, there is potential military activity by Kurdish forces up there, and that's where we find CNN's Jane Araf, who's coming to us via video phone from Dohuk. Christiane, we're about halfway here in Dohuk, between the Turkish border and between the city of Mosul, the second biggest city in Baghdad, and there are Kurdish forces ranged behind us on the mountaintop that looks towards Mosul. Now, we were on that mountain last night, a lookout point for Kurdish forces, and it's known that it's a lookout point as well for select American forces operating in this region. Now, Peshmerga soldiers, the Kurdish soldiers, were telling us that they had been seeing unidentified trucks driving without their lights on back and forth towards the line of Iraqi control last night. Those are believed to be military trucks. It seems all quiet this morning, uh, but they are certainly on watch here along the border, as they are along the Turkish border. Now, one of the concerns has been that Turkish troops would come in, and instead of a second front of American soldiers here to fight the Iraqis, there would be fighting breaking out between Turkish and Kurdish forces. Now, that seems to have been diffused, but there are still tens of thousands of Kurdish forces they say are ready to fight Turkish soldiers if they do come in too far. Christiane? Jane, I want to ask you a question on the issue of Saddam Hussein. You have been our bureau chief in Baghdad for many years and have observed him at least uh, on television. Did you hear his speech and are you able to recognize the Arabic and whether you believe it was him or not, given what you've heard over the years? That's always been the question, as you know, Christiane, whether it really is him. There's no indication that it wasn't. Now, it may very well have been pre-taped, but if it was pre-taped in an effort to assure the Iraqi population, that's one thing we all know as well, that the Iraqi population is not so easily reassured, and there is always a, a skepticism among Iraqis whether they are actually seeing their real president. 
again, no indication that that wasn't the real thing, but there always is that element of doubt, and certainly there's the element of doubt in the mind of the Iraqi people as well. Having grown up in that system, they all maintain a healthy skepticism about what they're seeing and what they're hearing, as you know, from their leaders. Christiane? Jane Araf, thank you very much there in northern Iraq, and we're going back to Aaron in Atlanta. Thank you. Christiane made a great point. Jane has been... Um, our Baghdad bureau chief for a long time. It's tough duty, and she is uh, she has done terrific work. We've we've gotten to see. I think all of us on this war, believe me, is not a television program, and none of us here think of it this way. But we've all wondered how, in as we prepared for this. Uh, how some of these systems that have been in place, the embedding system uh, was going to work when it actually, uh, when the bell rang, and the bell rang tonight, and we've had a pretty good sense of how it works. We're able to go to some remarkable places, um, and mostly we're able to see it pretty well. Becky Diamond is uh, on board the USS Milius, uh, and while sometimes these pictures get a little ragged, uh, we work with them because it's extraordinary to be able to get to them at all. Becky? Well, Aaron, I am standing on the USS Vilius, a destroyer in the northern Persian Gulf, thousands of miles from where you are on a video phone. This morning, about 9.02 Eastern Time, 5.02 local time, this ship launched eight Tomahawk missiles. One didn't make it too far, its booster fell not too far from me in the water, right beside me, but seven others launched successfully, reaching targets, which of course we don't know. Now, the ship has an unknown number of Tomahawk missiles, it does have more. The ship is waiting for its orders, and we'll have to see what's next. Aaron? Just give me, uh, this is one of those television questions, and I actually apologize. Just give me a sense of the mood there tonight, or this morning. Uh, is there a sense of excitement? Is there a sense of anxiety? What do, you, what do you pick up when you talk to the men and women on board? It's a fascinating, fascinating place to be right now. The mood when I arrived on board last week was anxious. There were a lot of people feeling a lot of tension with a lot of uncertainty, and that, that mood settled when the president spoke. And then there was a feeling of a mission, and no one's a more warmonger on this ship. I don't feel that at all. But people feel they have a mission, they have orders, and this is their job, and they're going to execute. And this morning, I would say there was almost a sense of relief with, a, with an order being executed. But people are reflective and somber. It's not a task that they take lightly. Aaron? Becky, thank you for your work today, and I suspect there's going to be some dramatic and difficult days for you and the crew members aboard that ship. Stay safe. Thank you. Becky Diamond aboard the Milius out there. Um, here, here is the context in some respects we have waited for for many hours tonight. This is the lead in the Washington Post that um, this is the Washington Post reporting and obviously we're working pretty hard to confirm it uh, but it's hard sometimes because in fact we're on the air and a lot of our correspondents are on the air and they're not able to do as much reporting as I know they'd like to do here's the lead in the Washington Post tomorrow today shortly before 4 p.m. yesterday director of central intelligence George J. Tenet offered President Bush the prospect improbable to the point of fantasy yet suddenly at hand that the war against Iraq might be transformed with its opening shots. The CIA said, te uh, Tenet said, believed it had a fix on Saddam Hussein. Hussein and others in the most senior levels of the Iraqi leadership and on the post story goes. So if this is, we're careful with this, this is the reporting of the Washington Post, pretty good reporters they, uh, that now at least we have some sense of what it was the Americans thought they had, why they felt they had a moment, an opportunity, improbable to the point of fantasy, yet suddenly at hand. A nice little piece of writing. Uh, Kelly McGann is among the groups that, uh, among the individuals, not a group, he's a person who works with us um, in special forces and understanding uh, a lot of this stuff. What's your take on that must have been a tantalizing moment when you think when the CIA director walks in and says, we think we got him in the crosshairs. It was, Aaron, and I watched you report it, and uh, it, it always puts a hitch in your throat. The bottom line is, and the most tantalizing piece of it is, that's something that can't be confirmed by satellites. In other words, it clearly indicates people on the ground. Uh, it, it, it indicates human intelligence. I think it was uh, General Clark earlier, but it may have been... Um 
may have been someone else, we've been at this a bit, who said one of the things that might be unsettling to Saddam is the fact that if they in fact targeted him, somebody who knows him, somebody close to him, some human being gave him up. Absolutely. Or that we that he has actual enemy people in his in his rear area right next to him and didn't know it that's that would be even more fear producing uh, especially with a person who loves to control things as much as as he does in the last war we know that he had a, at least 11 look-alikes so in order to prioritize the target list to step out of the kind of at least the initial planning we all know it goes south the first shot but the bottom line is in order to act on that they had to have direct eyes on the target and have reason to believe that be even with the time of flight of the missile that they had a chance of getting it and that's exciting it, it boy it sure p paints that whole Saddam uh, television speech in an entirely different light doesn't it I mean there must have been if if the post reporting in, in, uh, proves out and, and uh, there's no reason to believe it will not I mean I, I for one have great confidence in their reporting um, there must have been in American circles military circles intelligence circles a heart dropping moment uh, when they realized it didn't happen they didn't get him this uh, improbable to the point of fantasy moment but on the good side, Aaron, it gives rise to the run, rabbit, run, doesn't it? I, as I watched you report it, uh, I, I noticed that they were on again, off again, 10 minutes away, yes. nope, 20 minutes. Uh, that could be the rabbit that doesn't want to come out of his hole. And, and I think that clearly he looked a little bit distraught on television as well. I, so, I, I agree with that, that that was not... Again, you don't want to put too much, too fine a point on some of this stuff, but that was not the sort of confident, almost jaunty Saddam Hussein that we have seen off, very often over a long period of time. That's right. I mean, if you if you watch him in in his normal composure, he's leaning back, he's smoking, he's uh, basically uh, you know talking to people on bended knee. This was leaning forward. He clearly had a long face. Uh, he clearly had not been sleeping well. And uh, I think that uh, if you look closely at the, and listen to the way that he talked and, the, and the, the, man, the mannerisms he used, it was not his normal routine. Looks a lot older in that shot to me than he looked. Yes, he does. Now, I'll tell you something. I don't imagine you sleep very well at 40 cruise missiles or half that many, if there were two targets, half that many are raining down on where you were or where someone thought you were. Uh, that would keep me up at night. And, and, and we're talking about a man who needed a food taster. I yeah. mean, you know, what kind of life is that? And now it's coming to a, uh, a, a culmination here where literally a superpower is, is hunting him. I mean, that's got to be a very terrible feeling. Kelly, terrific work there. Thank you. Nick, uh, I'm not sure if you're able to hear. I'm not going to read the whole uh, lead again. But this notion that the CIA had Saddam Hussein, believed it had Saddam Hussein in his sights, and marry that off with the notion that Kelly underscored, which is it had to be human intelligence that gave him up. Nick? Nick. Well, it was a pretty good wind-up, Nick, I'll say that. I'm not sure we, uh, we may be having a little trouble with Nick Robertson's phone, which is all things considered. I think, considered I, I, think I hear you now. I think there we have some interference on the line. There you go, it Nick. Certainly, Aaron, it certainly fits into something that Iraqi officials uh, have been saying that uh, is going on here, part of a psychological warp. And when one thinks that the next phase of this uh, campaign will be bombing on the scale that will shock and awe the people here, a psychological phase, a buildup of continuing to mount the pressure that we know where you are, we've targeted you, Perhaps only President Saddam Hussein knows how closely that targeting actually came to him. But certainly from a psychological point of view, shock and awe will have a much greater effect on an enemy who is already feeling the psychological pressure. And one can see that building here. Again, the very quick response coming out on television. He did look older than his looked in the past. It was hastily prepared. The psychological impact of the psychological component here does appear to be having some effects at least Aaron Nick thank you uh, just a, a couple uh, for our viewers here a couple more pieces of detail out of the Washington Post uh, reporting on this um, the intelligence community 
believe this, uh, well, the intelligence was unforeseen, according to the Post, and perishable. He wasn't going to be wherever he was very long, presenting what one administration official called the target of opportunity. There was no guarantee at all, Tenet said, that his whereabouts would be pinpointed again. According to the Post reporting, he was in an anonymous Baghdad home. Let's read it. When President Bush signed the launch order at 6.30 p.m., it had been hastily prepared. The first shots would strike through the roof and walls of an anonymous Baghdad home and deep beneath it in hopes of decapitating the Iraqi government in a single blow. So when we talked earlier, uh, perhaps an hour or so ago, about the idea that this was not the opening act of this war that any of us had been prepared for, that you had been listening to and about for many, many weeks. Now you know exactly why. The CIA, and, and I think Kelly makes great sense, it had to be human intelligence, believed they had Saddam Hussein, that they had him in a house in Baghdad, some nondescript home, anonymous is the way the Post describes it, an anonymous home in Baghdad. This is the guy who rarely sleeps in the same place, same bed, two days in a row. And they thought they had him, and they moved the plan up because they thought they could get him. And the fact is, it turns out they did not, but it's an extraordinary piece of news to be able to report that the intelligence on the ground, and this bodes well, we must say for everything that is about to follow that the intelligence on the ground was at least credible enough to the people who analyze this sort of thing that they believed that they could toss 40 million dollars worth of weapons out there and maybe end this thing before it began. Um, we're trying to, to make some sense of the military moves that have gone on. I think that's what Miles O'Brien uh, is able to deal with now. Miles? Uh, Aaron, yes. Let me, first of all, I want to tell you a couple of things. We've uh, got some uh, satellite imagery of uh, the greater Baghdad area, a city of five million people. And we can give you a sense, if you uh, take a look at this imagery, of some of the targets of opportunity. That's actually the wrong shot right now. They're trying to set that one up. Claude, if I can have you go to the uh, uh, 101, the uh, keyhole graphic, and we're going to bring that up for you and try to give you a sense as we zoom in on um, Baghdad through the keyhole machine if you could put that up for me we'll get there that's actually the wrong machine as well uh, one more try there and we'll try to get this on GR 101 for those of you keeping score at home is what we're trying to get up on the air here you know what Aaron I, we're gonna try to get that graphic together we'll get back to you in just a minute okay thanks you know, we've had very few of these little glitches, and we brought things in from all over the world, and we have a glitch 30 feet behind me over in the corner. Go figure that. Um, it has been an extraordinary night, a night that none of us um, anticipated would play out in any way the way it has. Uh, but that's, that's the nature of this, I guess. We, we anticipate things, and then a piece of information comes, and it changed the whole run-up or layout of this thing. Uh, Christian, um, it's a pretty remarkable piece of news to report that the CIA thought they had the guy cold. It certainly is, and of course, we remember back from the first Gulf War that they tried over and over to do it then as well. I mean, there wasn't that open admission that he was a target back then, but it had been tried many, many times, and it failed back then. We still don't know exactly who was targeted and what actually happened in the pre-dawn attack on those locations in Baghdad today, so we'll obviously have to wait to see uh, what was the target and, and what or who, if anybody, was in fact caught. Um, but certainly in terms of what do we expect next, well, what do we expect? When will the actual first stage of massive uh, aerial bombardment happen, if indeed it does happen? And when then will the ground offensive start? We've been told that the, uh, the objective here is, although they're talking about such heavy bombardment, not to target and not to kill unnecessarily either Iraqi military or obviously civilians. What they say they want to do is try try to go in as soft as they can while going after legitimate military targets. And there are all sorts of possibilities that we've been told by uh, senior officers here about what they may expect. We don't even know whether these 17 uh, Iraqi, surrender, uh, Iraqi soldiers who surrendered might presage uh, hundreds, tens of thousands of Iraqis who might surrender in early hours. So we're really going to have to wait to see how this unfolds. And as you've been saying, as we've been saying, it's unfolded slightly differently than we had been led to believe. 
Back uh, to you, Aaron. Thank you, Christiane. I remember uh, General Clark saying to me in the early moments of the war in Afghanistan uh, back a year ago that these things actually never do quite the way you, uh, they never go quite the way you expect them. We just didn't expect to, the unexpected quite so quickly as it happened today. Um, Miles, you want to give it another go? Yeah, yeah, so let's give it another go, Aaron. I all think right. we finally have found uh, all the right buttons here. And as you say, it is always the things closest to home that seem to fail us. Uh, what I have to show you is some uh, pretty interesting satellite imagery. This isn't stuff real time. It's not like we're going to look at a bomb damage assessment, which is the term the Pentagon uses. This is imagery which was shot a year ago at Baghdad. And let's take that source and we'll zoom in on this region for you and give you a sense of some of the possible areas, some of the possible targets uh, of opportunity in the Baghdad region. Now, I should uh, give you the caveat. We don't know precisely where these 40 cruise missiles and where that F-117 was tasked to strike, but uh, we can tell you where some of the lucrative targets are as we zoom right in there on Baghdad. Take a look at this palace here. Uh, that palace is uh, the main palace uh, among Saddam Hussein's many dozens of palaces, literally. Lots of money spent over the years building shrines to himself all around uh, this country. Uh, that's just one of many. Uh, there's a compound right along the Tigris River. There's another palace that just went by there. You saw the Blue Dome. And yet another one right over here. These palaces, uh, he, as you have pointed out many times, Aaron, uh, Saddam Hussein does not like to sleep in the same bed uh, twice in a row. A couple of other places that might be of great interest for targets, uh, the Council of Ministers. This is where um, the uh, Iraqi uh, government, the, the, uh, the uh, people closest to Saddam Hussein meet. It's actually an old convention center now, but a possible target as well. The Ministry of Information. Now, we know the Ministry of Information is standing. Why do we know that? Well, that's where that live picture that you've been seeing has been coming from. Uh, you've been seeing it. The shot that we're showing is actually looking, uh, looking out in this direction. And if I uh, move up just a little bit, you can sort of get a sense of what you're looking at there. Uh, there's that uh, shot, which you've seen many times in our, our pictures. There's that shot of the uh, mosque. That mosque is right in this area. And then we had a shot looking down that bridge just a little while ago. So the field of view of that camera is somewhere like this, or really, uh, now that it's been panned over, it's something like this. So you can get a sense of, of where it is looking. There's another very interesting t uh, potential target. And we're talking about regime targets here. Regime targets, that's uh, the goal is not to take out power plants and, and um, ruin the water supply, that sort of thing, to cause hardship to the people. The idea is to go after the regime. This is the Ministry of uh, Military Industrial uh, the military industrial complex, if you will. This is uh, sort of the, the headquarters for the weapons of mass destruction uh, capability uh, in Iraq and has been over the years. And finally, uh, over here, uh, right next to it, is where the Iraqi uh, parliament uh, meets. Uh, interesting, when you're talking about regime targets, uh, this is a place you might want to take a quick look at. This is the place where you've seen those pictures of Saddam Hussein constantly firing off pistols. Uh, that is, uh, every time you see that, that is shot right here. That's kind of the uh, Lenin Square, uh, the, so the, the top of Lenin's tomb, I should say, the Kremlin, if you will, for uh, Saddam Hussein, and that's where those parades occur. Anyway, those are possible targets. We don't know that that's where they were striking. Nevertheless, gives you a little tour of Baghdad. Aaron? Thank you, Miles. Miles O'Brien knows more than space.